Bene, io direi che possiamo ri- riprendere il nostro lavoro, parlo con gli, gli studenti, ma eh, ringrazio intanto, do il benvenuto a tutti quelli che si sono aggiunti, perché da questo momento fino alla, all'arrivo della... Um, da questo momento fino alle 6 circa eh, si tratta invece di quel lavoro che vi avevo già annunciato del seminario su brutalismo, stile, architettura e conflitto nel quale mh, ospitiamo il professor Nicholas Thoburn dell'Università di Manchester che si collegherà eh, con noi tra un'oretta, eh, ma eh, cominciamo con una introduzione all'argomento di oggi che è appunto darà gli elementi di comprensione storica e, e concettuale del, del brutalismo sia come stile architettonico che come eh, sì, però eh, aspetta eh, a entrare eh, Jacopo perché io in questo momento ero già dentro con il programma che stavo illustrando dicevo che eh, me l'hai fatto uscire eh, sì. Scusami Andrea, stavo cercando di eh, visualizzare il PowerPoint. Per tu lo puoi visualizzare, poi quando hai trovato l'immagine la carichi dalla, da, con l'apposito documento. Dicevo <ride> che eh, appunto ringrazio le persone che sono aggiunte ora, cioè i dottorandi, gli studenti di architettura che hanno chiesto di prendere parte al programma <ride> seminario e eh, i colleghi vari, ma in particolare Annalisa Trentin che è la coordinatrice del dottorato, perché come avete visto già nel materiale informativo, questo seminario è organizzato dal, eh, dal d- d- dottorato in architettura e cultura del progetto dell'Università di Bologna, in collaborazione con il eh, Collegio Internazionale di, di Filosofie, de Filosofie e, per un programma che è appunto diretto dal nostro eh, collega segnista Jacopo Galimberti, quindi che ha due, due giacche in questo, in questo veste, due giacche, quella del nostro dipartimento e quella del Collegio di Filosofia. Jacopo è un segnista, è, è storico dell'arte e sociologo di formazione, eh, quindi eh, si è occupato mh, di eh, rapporti tra immagini e cultura in modo articolato in relazione anche a fenomeni recenti della cultura europea negli anni 70-80, eh, quindi ha tutto un corte di studi recenti su queste dimensioni, in particolare sulle immagini nell'operaismo, nella tradizione dei movimenti eh, antagonisti degli anni eh, post 68 in Italia. E chiederei quindi a Jacopo, a cui cedo anche il controllo, <ride> il controllo diciamo, dell'inserimento delle immagini, di eh, partire con la sua introduzione, poi voi fate tutte le domande che è il caso se non capite, eh, su- chiederei a tutti di eh, Usare la, la tecnica in alto nella barra de, de, del Teams, c'è cioè una manina, eh, usare la tecnica di alzare la mano, no? Queste, di, di alzare la mano e io do la parola a, per domande o altro, o di scrivere in pazienza che possiamo vedere quello che chiedete. Quindi grazie Jacopo, intanto. Poi grazie a te Andrea. Allora, um, io innanzitutto voglio cercare di capire un aspetto tecnico. Il PowerPoint dovrebbe potersi caricare, ma in realtà non appare. Come mai? Come mai? Eh, eh. Doveva fare la prova prima se avevi un PowerPoint di, di incerto. Se tu lo cari, tu devi visualizzare, devi prima aprire il PowerPoint nel tuo schermo. Poi... Sì, eh, già allora, no, eh, purtroppo... Devi aprirlo nel tuo, nel tuo desktop e poi dopo a prendere l'icona in alto a destra, okay, il cedimento, lo visualizzi e dopo quando ci sei dentro fai scorrere il PowerPoint. Sì, facciamo così, lo mettiamo sul desktop così vediamo se questa cosa facilita. No, lo devi aprire nel desktop e poi, e poi dopo okay. caricarlo nel visore condiviso con quell'attrezzo che c'è di fianco, abbandono subito a sinistra. C'è un, nella barra dei una freccina e lì come la, del resto l'hai usata prima, quindi la, lo sai come Io eh, sono un po' preoccupato perché... Tutto il sound? 
Qual è perché dove? sul desktop non mi dà il PowerPoint. Cioè non il mi fa vedere... Il che... tuo? Sì, il mio, il mio. E adesso c'è, guarda, se tu guardi dietro si vede un PowerPoint. Adesso l'hai caricato. Voi lo vedete? Prima lo vedete? si vedeva, per un attimo fa l'avevi caricato. Un attimo fa si vedeva il tuo desktop. Ok, ah, ok, così, voi lo vedete adesso, vero? Ecco, sì, adesso lo vediamo, guarda, io mi tolgo da, da ingombrare l'immagine, così adesso lo, bene. adesso lo vedono tutti. Bene, e... bene, bene. Allora, ottimo. Tranquilli che ce la facciamo. Sì, sì, no, io <ride> devo premettere che fa. è la prima volta che uso Teams per una lezione, quindi per questo sono un po' impacciato. Non Dunque, eh, minimizziamo anche la cosa. Um, sì, allora il mio intervento eh, ha sostanzialmente la, la finalità di poter introdurre la, uh, la lecture di uh, Nicola Stobon che inizierà alle tre. E non è, eh, è diciamo, una, una lecture introduttiva che eh, eh, si, si rivolge soprattutto a un pubblico, come dicevo, dicevamo già nella, nella brochure, di non esperti, quindi non, non diremo molte cose nuove, però insomma... È un tentativo di contestualizzare il brutalismo sia nell'accezione corrente, questo è il primo punto del mio intervento, quindi cosa si intende sostanzialmente per brutalismo oggi, però eh, volevo anche eh, presentarvi altri aspetti. Innanzitutto il brutalismo eh, è anche, come si tratta di, di, oggi appunto di uno stile architettonico, è molto importante cercare di capire anche la percezione personale. Eh, gli edifici vanno vissuti, attraversati, usati. Quindi come ho avuto la fortuna di eh, fare esperienza diretta a lungo di un edificio brutalista anche abbastanza importante, volevo accennarvi eh, alla questione. Uh, il brutalismo come stile artistico culturale, cioè il brutalismo, e questo lo vedremo fra poco, inizialmente non era esclusivamente uno stile architettonico e infine nella quarta parte che è quella più legata a, di, di Nicholas Taubon eh, introduce dire, più direttamente la questione del council housing cioè in sostanza diciamo le case popolari inglesi allora andiamo avanti quindi brutalismo nell'accezione corretta il brutalismo nell'accezione corrente, come vi dicevo, è uno stile architettonico che emerge negli anni 50 e inizia la sua parabola discendente nella seconda metà degli anni 70. La caratteristica principale di questo stile architettonico, quello che lo caratterizza, è quella di lasciare gli elementi portanti a vista e soprattutto il calcestruzzo, il cemento in sostanza. Um, Qui nell'immagine a destra si può vedere, eh, ecco io non sono naturalmente un esperto di queste cose, ma intuitivamente si mostra come si, come si forma, come si crea una, eh, una barra di calcestruzzo, cioè si ha una gettata di, eh, di calcestruzzo liquido all'interno di una forma eh, che in questo caso è in legno, poi si toglie la forma, quando, quando il contenuto è solido e autoportante eh, si ottiene la barra di calcestruzzo. Uh, detto in modo molto banale, se ci fosse qui un ingegnere sicuramente avrebbe qualcosa da ridire, ma insomma, questo è essenzialmente... Ma almeno nominiamo il ferro del cemento, è armato il cemento perché dentro ci sono delle interattori di ferro, no? Lo dice solo qui. Esatto. Però non sono un ingegnere neanche, era solo per dare... perché li intravedo anche nella tua foto. Quindi. Sì, 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 esatto, esatto. In questo caso si parla di cemento armato, esatto. Quello che, ecco, eh, volevo farvi osservare nell'immagine a sinistra è... Eh, come si possa utilizzare eh, le, come dire, la, le texture che il legno lascia sul calcestruzzo non trattato. Eh, con qualche accorgimento si possono creare, come si può vedere, eh, quasi una forma decorativa, perché ogni, ogni barra ha, la, ha, ha, come dire, eh, se, ha preso la for una forma leggermente diversa, alcune sono non conservano, sono state trattate in modo da non avere queste texture, quindi si possono creare delle forme alternate. Certo, eh, è una decorazione molto limitata, il colore è omogeneo, uniforme, eh, il cemento certo non, 
come dire, non, non evoca eh, atmosfere come dire, molto intime o particolari, è, un, è, un, è, è tutto molto ridotto chiaramente, però eh, ecco, sicuramente si possono creare eh, delle, delle sorte di decorazioni. Questo in particolare è, è il National Theatre di Londra, la parte interna dell'edificio. Dopo lo mostro. Il terzo punto, eh, che è fondamentale, è la genealogia del termine, cioè brutalismo da dove viene. Allora, diciamo subito che il termine in italiano brutto non c'entra nulla. L'origine è russa, si parla sia di un, di un termine svedese che, del, che della parola invece francese brut, però nella sostanza diamo per assodato che il che il termine originario sia brut, che in francese significa grezzo non trattato. E eh, avete capito perché, quindi in sostanza gli, gli elementi importanti non vengono trattati né occultati. Eh, abbiamo detto che il brutalismo eh, diciamo, emerge negli anni 50. Retrospettivamente, importante questo aspetto, uno dei capisaldi del, del brutalismo è l'unità di abitazione di eh, Le Corbusier, uno dei grandi architetti del Novecento, eh, svizzero che però eh, lavora e, e si forma almeno in parte eh, nella, nella Francia degli anni 10 e 20, in realtà lavora anche in Germania, ma insomma è parte integrante della, della cultura delle avanguardie che si sviluppa a Parigi in quegli anni. E eh, questo, questo edificio, come potete vedere, adesso avete già qualche elemento, è un edificio brutalista, anche se probabilmente il termine non esisteva ancora, anzi di fatto il termine non esisteva ancora al momento della Perché è brutalista? Perché le strutture portanti sono visibili, il cemento eh, non è stato trattato, tutta la struttura griglia è assolutamente eh, grezza, e, eh, qui cominciate a vedere uno degli aspetti fondamentali di questo stile, cioè in realtà questo è un edificio molto famoso, visitabile, curato, eh, perlomeno negli ultimi tempi è stato più volte ristrutturato, eccetera. Quello che però vedete è che, eh, o perlomeno intuite, è che il cemento non invecchia benissimo, cioè eh, qui non si vede molto, ma insomma si può intuire. Eh, il cemento non, eh, calcestruzzo non coperto, non trattato, tende ad assorbire l'umidità e quindi quello che ne viene sono spesso delle, delle ombre, delle macchie, delle chiazze o addirittura in casi peggiori proprio un iniziale decadimento delle strutture. Scusatemi, ho ricevuto una, forse una... Non so, vabbè, lasciamo perdere. Meno che non, mi, mi interrompo un attimo perché se fosse Nick Tobon... Eh, niente, vabbè, come non è. Allora, quindi eh, Le Corbusier, uno dei padri, diciamo, del brutalismo. Tra l'altro, eh, uno dei primi a usare il, il concetto di cemento di beton brut, nel senso che poi sarà proprio del brutalismo. Eh, quindi cemento grezzo. Volevo farvi vedere anche il tetto di questa struttura. Uh, perché oltre che essere molto famosa, forse un'immagine che avete già vista, vi dice qualcosa sul, sulla bellezza, se volete, sulla poesia, eh, come si dice a volte, del brutalismo. Cioè, in realtà, eh, questo, questo, questa attenzione che si rivolge alle, alle forme e ai blocchi eh, riesce a volte a creare delle sorti, dei, dei giochi di volume o degli effetti scultori attraverso le masse di cemento. E come vedete è lasciato, è lasciato grezzo, vedete i gradini, oppure qui questa struttura. Eh, in realtà queste, queste, queste strutture, credo, questa credo sia una sala a riunioni eh, e questa sorta di camino molto stilizzato, sono come l'altra immagine suggerisce, profondamente legate al, al linguaggio cubista. Qui avete un quadro di Os Enfants, che fa parte dello stesso movimento di cui fa parte Le Corbusier, che si chiama Purismo, 
eh, qui il titolo è composizione purista e come vedete anche se le due opere diciamo, sono separate da più di vent'anni eh, hanno delle somiglianze cioè una scala ridotta di colori un'attenzione alle forme solide e geometriche un certo appiattimento dei volumi cioè in realtà eh, già qui benché non si tratti certo di cemento Uh, si incomincia quasi a sviluppare una certa estetica uh, che poi verrà ripresa da uh, Le Corbusier. Forse c'è già un accenno di brutalismo, potremmo dire, già negli anni venti. Comunque torneremo sulla questione fra poco. Uh, ci sono un numero, c'è un numero infinito di, di, di edifici brutalisti in Europa, uh, quindi lungi da me farvi un, un elenco. Volevo solo mostrarvi alcuni, alcuni edifici che sono particolarmente noti, particolarmente visibili. Uh, questo è il National Theatre, come vi ho già mostrato in immagine precedente. Uh, si trova sul Tamigi, si trova a Londra. Uh, se andate a Londra probabilmente l'avete intravisto, è molto visibile anche da lontano. È, come vedete, un edificio brutalista, cioè... Il calcestruzzo è lasciato a vista, le strutture portanti non sono nascoste e questo eh, come dire, favorisce eh, varie forme di riappropriazione. Eh, qui ve ne, ho, ve ne ho indicata solo una, quella della, della cultura o subcultura dei, dei graffiti degli anni 70 e 80 e eh, eh, dello skateboard, che sono, se andate, se andate a Londra, eh, sono molto presenti nel, tra le colonne di questi, di questi edifici, uh, cioè dell'edificio del National Theatre. Però il brutalismo eh, ha avuto successo anche nel cosiddetto blocco sovietico, quindi qui vi, vi mostro un'immagine di, di un sanatorio che si trova a Yalta, quindi in Crimea, quindi in un territorio che oggi è conteso tra, tra Russia e Ucraina. Uh, e come vedete le, le potenzialità del, del cemento armato qui eh, si intuiscono, anche senza non essere degli esperti, eh, le strutture, direi quasi le acrobazie sono evidenti. Um, a destra avete invece una, degli edifici eh, di punta di una eh, mostra universale che si è tenuta a Montréal, nel, nel Canada, nella parte francese. Eh, anzi francofona, che eh, è stata appunto realizzata negli anni 60. Qui avete uno studente, quello che allora era uno studente di architettura, ehm, un architetto canadese israeliano, credo. E eh, quindi in realtà è ecco, una piccola parentesi, il cemento eh, non è stato, come dire, una scoperta del Novecento ovviamente, si usava anche in epoca romana, però eh, in realtà... Il cemento richiede delle temperature molto elevate per, per poter essere utilizzato e raggiungere queste elevate temperature eh, costa molto. Eh, quindi eh, è stato sostanzialmente possibile fare un largo uso di cemento solo eh, nella parte finale dell'Ottocento, quando con la rivoluzione industriale si sono sviluppati dei, come dire, delle, mh, strumenti tecnici che potevano uh, diminuire il costo del la produzione di energia e di calore necessario alla, 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 come dire, alla costruzione di cemento, alla produzione di cemento. Un altro edificio piuttosto noto sempre a Londra è eh, Frelick Tower, in questo caso si tratta di un edificio di abitazione. Um, allora, vi ho mostrato, vi mostro sia all'interno, nell'immagine in alto a sinistra, ma soprattutto quello che mi interessa è, è mostrarvi la differenza evidente tra l'architettura la, locale, quella delle Terrace Houses eh, eh, di Londra, che, che immagino voi conosciate, qui sono strutture di 3-4 piani, e l'edificio totalmente fuori scala, eh, diciamo, eh, realizzato da Golfingham. Eh, non solo fuori scala, ma anche, come dire, esteticamente molto diverso. Eh. Non, voglio, non voglio approfondire la questione, ma è chiaramente un'estetica di tipo industriale tecnologica che, che ben poco ha a che vedere invece con, con la domesticità, con l'estetica diciamo, domestica più tradizionale 
che viene suggerita dalle case che si trovano, che vedete a sinistra. Eh, questo è un edificio molto noto e che è diventato negli ultimi anni, produco già un aspetto fondamentale, nella, che sarà fondamentale nell'intervento nell di Tobon, che è quello della gentrificazione, della rivalutazione dei, di, degli edifici brutalisti. Dunque, qui avete un, uh, un poster che voi potete comprare per 25 pound, e uh, quindi già questo ovviamente la dice lunga su come dire, le, la rivalutazione di questi edifici, ma volevo concentrarmi su alcuni commenti che vengono fatti uh, su internet uh, per cercare di promuovere, no? di fare il uh, marketing di questo, di questo poster. Si dice in sostanza, Piccola parentesi, voi mi sentite Andrea? Tu mi senti? Sì, sì, sì. io ti sento, ogni tanto ti sposti dal microfono, si perde una parolina ogni tanto, ma per ora scorre tutto chiaro, okay. c'è un punto solo che non ho capito la parola, ma non ti ho fermato, quindi bene. stai vicino al microfono, Va bene. perché vai Dunque, avanti e dietro. Uh... Volevo solo uh, come dire, attirare la vostra attenzione su alcuni punti chiave. Innanzitutto, quello che questo, su internet è che le autorità hanno incominciato a capire che l'architettura brutalista causava dei problemi, ho sottolineato la frase. Questo è un aspetto fondamentale in realtà di tutta la storia dell'architettura, cioè eh, l'idea che le forme architettoniche possono addirittura creare delle forme sociali, delle forme di legame sociale, delle forme di comunità o al contrario creare dei problemi. Ecco, questo è un, è un punto fondamentale perché naturalmente eh, che, 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 che le forme dello spazio possano indurre o meno delle, delle, delle forme di relazione sociale, questo è, come dire, condivisibile e, e comprensibile, ma che addirittura, perché questo che si dice, le forme causino dei problemi, eh, questo sembra qualcosa di ben altro, di molto diverso. In realtà eh, questo è fondamentale, perché spesso, lo vedremo, penso dopo con, con Nick, è stato proprio attribuito al brutalismo eh, quasi la, la responsabilità eh, del decadimento di, di tante council housing. Eh, ovviamente le cose non stanno così, poi lo vedremo rapidamente. Eh, volevo anche dire questo, che ehm, naturalmente il, il, il brutalismo fiorisce negli anni 50, 60 e in parte anche 70, e sono quindi anni in cui eh, di grande, come dire, eh, sono, sono gli anni del boom economico, però anche una grande crescita culturale del cinema, dell'arte, inevitabilmente il brutalismo è diventato anche uno dei temi di, tanti, di tante produzioni culturali, quindi di alcuni romanzi, di alcuni film. Qui è citato Ballard, eh, volevo mostrarvi anche il Barbican, ma questo forse lasciamolo perdere per il momento, e volevo invece qui eh, illustrarvi l'utilizzo del brutalismo in uno dei più bei film di Kubrick, che forse lo conoscete, mi auguro, arancia meccanica. Eh, come vedete, come queste immagini suggeriscono, il brutalismo ha un ruolo specifico nel film, cioè quello di, eh, diciamo, possiamo forse riassumere così, di alludere, innanzitutto di rendere riconoscibile il luogo. Mm, si tratta dell'Inghilterra, di Londra, eh, questo è abbastanza chiaro quando uno guarda il film, però il, queste strutture esistenti in realtà nel contesto del film sembrano quasi delle strutture avveniristiche e quindi il brutalismo qui serve quasi a una funzione eh, come dire eh, molto, una funzione semantica molto chiara quella di, di alludere a una sorta di distopia a una sorta di distopia negativa eh, situata in un futuro prossimo ehm, e quindi insomma ha delle connotazioni eh, urbane generalmente negative tra parentesi eh, la, la struttura che vedete in alto a destra che, che nelle scene del film è una struttura dove è sostanzialmente torturato è un'università eh, si tratta di Brunel eh, University un po' fuori, sempre a Londra ma un po', un po lontana dal centro 
e um, perché? perché chiaramente gli anni 60 gli anni, ci sono tante università costruite con uno stile brutalista per il banale motivo che eh, gli anni 60 sono come sapete anni in cui eh, c'è un boom di immatricolazioni e quindi anche di costruzione di università e siccome sono anche gli anni del brutalismo molte università inglesi hanno uno stile brutalista ho invertito le parti, quella che doveva essere la parte numero 3 diventa la parte numero 2. Comunque, il brutalismo come stile artistico-culturale. Io vi presenterò rapidamente, essenzialmente, le tesi presenti in questo libro. Eh, io direi, di, uh, scusatemi, guardo sempre chi è che mi sta scrivendo perché... Vabbè, questo... Eh, I pro e i contro del brutalismo li spiegherò dopo. Dunque... Le tesi di questo libro che è uscito nel 2017, che è un libro che vi consiglio, e che dice essenzialmente una cosa. Dice, bene, oggi il brutalismo è, è uno stile architettonico, più o meno criticato, ma insomma è fondamentalmente uno stile architettonico. Ma il brutalismo non era uno stile architettonico all'inizio. Eh, e quando, quando si situa l'inizio eh, di questo dibattito? Il, il, il libro lo situa sostanzialmente all'inizio degli anni 50 con eh, un articolo che come vedete è dello stesso autore che viene spesso citato come uno dei, dei principali cri critici nel senso di, di, di critico d'arte del brutalismo. Quindi in sostanza la, questo volume cerca di eh, ricostruire la, la distanza culturale e storica tra l'articolo del 55 e il libro del 66. In questi dieci anni il brutalismo perde quella che era la sua caratteristica originale, che adesso vedremo, per diventare uno stile architettonico. Dunque, queste sono per esempio alcune delle immagini che accompagnavano l'articolo uh, di Barham. Come vedete, sì, c'è in basso a destra un, un edificio, dopo vediamo di cosa si tratta, però in realtà quello che viene descritto come brutalista sembra essere qualcos'altro, cioè una sorta di trend culturale o di atmosfera culturale o che eh, secondo Banham eh, attraversa una pluralità di forme espressive, quindi la scultura, però anche la pittura e certo anche l'architettura. Allora, voglio concentrarmi rapidamente su eh, opere che vengono che ho cerchiato nella, nel PowerPoint. Dunque, eh, Cosa accomuna, perché di questo si tratta, il sacco di Burri, che è l'opera in alto a sinistra, un quadro di Jackson Pollock, in alto a destra, e una scultura di Edoardo Paolozzi, un artista scozzese di origine italiana, eh, che vedete eh, nel mezzo. Ecco, cercare di capire cosa accomuna queste tre cose, tra, tra le altre che venivano citate, è chiaramente un lavoro perché bisogna ricostruire, quasi come un antropologo, se volete, una cultura, quella in questo caso, o forse anche una scultura, cioè il mondo artistico underground inglese degli anni, underground o comunque diciamo non conformista degli anni 50 di Londra, il suo gergo, la sua percezione di quello che sta accadendo nella società inglese, i suoi riferimenti artistici, culturali, politici, sono uh, un po' tra l'America e l'Europa, quindi è un lavoro delicato ed è il lavoro che svolge appunto Aimo nel libro che vi ho indicato prima. Eh, perché? Perché beh, quelle le, le somiglianze che noi potremmo vedere, intravedere o immaginarci non sono necessariamente quelle che vedevano eh, questi giovani nei, nei primi anni 50. Dunque, eh, io direi così che eh, avendo letto il libro vi posso dire quelle che erano, beh, quelle che erano un po' le analogie che vedeva Banam e che cercava di catturare, di descrivere attraverso il concetto di brutalismo. Beh, innanzitutto ehm, quello che accomunava queste opere era una certa attenzione prestata alla spontaneità. Quindi la spontaneità è una in varie accezioni, cioè la spontaneità del gesto, in questo caso per esempio Pollock, 
entra nella tela, la tela, forse lo sapete, il Pollock le, dipingeva con la tela posta per terra, in orizzontale, entrava a volte nella tela, sono spesso delle tele molto grandi, però anche la spontaneità del, del banale, del quotidiano, eh, che voi ritrovate nel, nel sacco di Burri, ma la spontaneità anche del, dell'opera d'arte primitiva. E primitivo ha una pluralità di significati. No? Eh, negli anni 50, come del resto all'inizio del secolo Novecento, eh, era un termine che indicava nell'ambito artistico una generale assenza di connotati culturali riconoscibili come tali. Quindi poteva essere l'arte, la produzione non so, artistica, chiamiamola così, dei bambini, però anche eh, semplicemente di, di, di adulti che non avevano una formazione culturale artistica, canonica, diciamo, quindi una scuola, una scuola delle arti. Primitivo poteva però indicare anche, questo ovviamente era molto più eh, complicato e aveva delle sfumature razziste, eh, l'arte delle popolazioni non occidentali, eh, non, non progredite, non civilizzate, questi sono diciamo, i termini dell'epoca. Eh, in questo caso però il primitivo veniva eh, come dire, appropriato da un artista che invece aveva ricevuto una formazione più canonica, aveva tutti gli strumenti per capire eh, come dire, le regole scritte e non scritte dell'arte degli anni 50, quindi una persona molto sofisticata in questo caso e che ribaltava le connotazioni negative del primitivo. Ora, come venivano, con, come dire, nella didascalia delle immagini, Banham accennava, dava degli spunti per interpretare eh, queste opere, Rispetto a Paolozzi parlava, per esempio, lo ho scritto lì in passo a destra, di sofisticato primitivismo, che è ovviamente una contraddizione, no? perché se il, se il primitivismo è sofisticato non è primitivismo. Rispetto a Pollock parlava invece di composizione a formale in azione. Anche qui c'è, se volete, una contraddizione, perché il termine composizione a formale sembra un po' un ossimoro. In azione fa riferimento all'action painting, cioè appunto alla, alla modalità di intervenire sulla tela tipica di Pollock e in realtà anche di altri artisti. Voglio ora venire all'edificio che come vedete eh, era in basso a destra. Qui è un'opera piuttosto famosa di, di Peter e Alison Smith, che sono considerati dei maggiori esponenti del, del brutalismo britannico. Qui eh, l'idea del lasciare, come dire, del non occultare le strutture portanti diventa qualcosa di ancora più estremo. Come vedete, i tubi che portano l'acqua e i lavandini non vengono minimamente nascosti. Vedete l'immagine in basso a sinistra. Um, quindi questo vi permette di come dire, entrare un po' di più nell'epoca e nel, nel contesto culturale. Quindi qui la spontaneità di Pollo col primitivismo sofisticato diventa, in termini architettonici, eh, il non nascondere come dire, le dinamiche, il, il sistema di produzione, la, eh, i materiali, i, i, come dire, la, la parte nascosta di un edificio. No? come se fosse qualcosa da valorizzare, non da nascondere. Cioè le tubature, eh, in questo caso eh, ma potrebbe, potrebbe essere il calorifero, eccetera, eccetera. Cioè le, tutto quello che come dire, è funzionale alla vita all'interno di un edificio e che però viene generalmente nascosto dalle strutture. In vari modi, insomma, ma se immaginarvi qua. Un altro aspetto fondamentale per capire allora il brutalismo per come era all'inizio, cioè come era diciamo, concepito nei primi anni 50, è anche l'art brut, eh, che designa ad un tempo uno stile, quello di Jean Dubuffet, un artista francese, ma anche a sua volta una serie di opere che lui collezionava. E cosa contraddistingue queste opere? 
eh, beh, il fatto di essere realizzate, come diceva lui, o almeno secondo lui, da coloro che sono esenti da cultura artistica. Allora, nella fattispecie, il buffet eh, dove andava a cercare queste opere? Beh, soprattutto nei manicomi, o meglio, nelle collezioni dei medici che si occupavano dei manicomi e che fin negli anni 20, gli anni 20 e gli anni 30 avevano saputo apprezzare l'arte prodotta dalle persone che si trovavano in manicomio. Du Buffet, queste sono opere però di Du Buffet, che si ispira a appunto, questo tipo di produzione eh, non, tra virgolette, non culturale, in realtà eh, il termine culturale è ovviamente molto delicato, perché suggerisce una... una Dire una, una discriminazione evidente tra ciò che è cultura e ciò che non lo è, sono spesso opere incentrate su un uso molto specifico e pronunciato dei materiali. Guardate, eh, come dire, la pittura qui cosa diventa? Diventa quasi un labirinto di forme, di, di, di materiali che si, che, che si attorcigliano. Eh, ecco, è ancora un, un quast. Si tratta di pittura? Beh, sì e no, potrebbe essere per certi aspetti una scultura, o comunque chiaramente negli anni 50 queste sono, sono forme estremamente non canoniche, quasi diciamo, uh, anzi assolutamente provocatorie. Uh, oh, scusate. Come vedete, quindi il termine è sempre, è sempre uh, brut, quindi non trattato, grezzo, brutale in un certo senso, non brutto, brutale, e eh, ci sono, ecco, adesso stiamo, stiamo entrando lentamente un po' in questa mentalità degli anni 50, almeno la mentalità di questo gruppo sociale, ci sono degli aspetti effettivamente che ricordano, allora, eh, i sacchi di burri, sì, uno può dire, sì, capisco, vedo le analogie adesso, vedo le analogie, forse è un po' più difficile vederle invece con l'architettura, però ecco, vi ho dato degli elementi per poter eh, ipotizzare perlomeno quello che attirava eh, Banham è quello che gli faceva assimilare queste opere eh, con eh, l'edificio degli Smithson. Quindi, per concludere questa, questa parte, eh, la verità dei materiali, ecco, questo è un termine quasi dell'architettura modernista, però cosa significa? Significa essenzialmente che i materiali eh, non devono essere nascosti, trattati, i materiali hanno la loro, la loro poesia, la loro, come dire, la loro, eh, la loro, le loro forme di espressione che devono, tra virgolette, essere rispettate. Ecco qui, scusate, non l'ho detto subito, ho cercato di riassumere come dire, alcune aree, aree semantiche, alcuni aspetti del, del brutalismo. È molto difficile definire cose così lontane, diverse, come un edificio, un'opera d'arte, una scultura. Quindi come dire, la vaghezza è, è, è consustanziale alla, al tentativo di definire qualcosa che non è così facilmente eh, circoscrivibile. Comunque, quindi la verità dei materiali è un termine quasi tecnico dell'architettura dell moderna, ma che qui assume un significato leggermente diverso. Qui diventa quasi un culto, eh, della, come dire, della, del materiale, della, della sua vita, della sua identità. Eh, quasi, ecco, e qui vedete subito delle analogie con eh, altre caratteristiche che abbiamo intravisto, per esempio l'autenticità, la, la pittura eh, di Pollock sembra essere una pittura realizzata quasi in modo impulsivo, spontaneo, come se fosse un'espressione appunto autentica della personalità dell'artista, una traduzione materiale del, del caos che abita uh, l'artista. Eh, e quindi il concetto di onestà, cioè appunto rendere giustizia uh, ai materiali, alle forme, non cercare di camuffarle di abbellire eh, e quindi il primitivismo come fonte di ispirazione, primitivo, originale, privo di cultura, che però qui non diventa più una privazione ma una qualità positiva, 
antiretorico, chiaramente, cioè privo di abbellimenti, di, dec di decorazioni aggiunte in qualche misura, e poi un aspetto che non ho affrontato perché forse è quello più complesso, però eh, al quale vi invito a riflettere, è quello del trauma. Stiamo parlando naturalmente degli anni 50, dovete immaginare in particolare l'Inghilterra, certe parti dell'Europa, città distrutte, eh, il, il boom economico inizia solamente verso la fine degli anni 50. Quindi carenze di ogni tipo, mancanze di alimenti, di infrastrutture, di strade percorribili. Eh, ecco, è, è questo il panorama, come dire, che si trovano di fronte. L Londra, come sapete, è stata bombardata, alcune città inglesi come Coventry sono state sostanzialmente distrutte. Eh, questo è il panorama che si trovano di fronte a eh, questi architetti e questi artisti, molti dei quali hanno partecipato direttamente alla guerra. Quindi eh, non possiamo prescindere da, da, da riflettere sulla questione del trauma. Eh, per finire volevo solo mostrarvi come appunto eh, si possa, il brutalismo possa unire eh, organico e inorganico. Questo è eh, un dettaglio che viene utilizzata eh, da, da Peter Allison Smithson per costruire l'Economist. Cioè loro usano un tipo di pietra che come vedete è una pietra pietra molto antica che conserva traccia della vita, della vita preistorica. No? Queste sono delle sorte di conchiglie eh, di cui, ancestrali di cui rimane traccia nella pietra che quindi da lontano sembra una pietra, sembra quasi un, un dipinto astratto se volete eh, e da vicino invece vi racconta la storia della Terra. Allora, mi rimane un quarto d'ora, quindi cercherò di essere un po' più rapido. Dunque, il, il brutalismo vissuto. Allora, come dicevo, ci tengo molto a, a raccontarvi delle esperienze di un edificio brutalista. Vi invito a fare altrettanto, cioè a guardare dall'interno gli edifici, cercare di vedere... Perché, sai, è facile commentare delle foto, però poi bisogna misurarsi con, con l'utilizzo reale degli spazi. Dunque, questo è un edificio gigantesco in, che diventa quasi un pezzo di città. Sono delle case popolari costruite a Evry-sur-Seine, eh, cioè nella periferia di Parigi. Eh, nel 69-75 le date qui sono importanti perché, perché l'architetto eh, eh, Renaudy cerca in qualche misura, adesso lo vedete anche nelle altre immagini, di utilizzare il brutalismo quasi in una chiave ludica, in una chiave ludica che emerge anche certo dal, dal movimento del 68 e da una certa critica eh, delle gerarchie, del, dell'ordine sociale. Questa naturalmente non è banalmente la traduzione di questi di questo movimento, ma sicuramente si nutre di questo immaginario. Come vedete, ehm, un pezzo non, non, non da poco, perché il municipio è, è, è appena sopra, qui sopra c'è l'inizio di quello che è il municipio di Vrissiusen, quindi siamo nel centro di questa cittadina che ha circa 100.000 abitanti, che è stato totalmente eh, ric come dire, concepito dall'architetto. L'edificio diventa struttura urbana. Eh, All'interno, come potete immaginare, qui sono dei negozi, tutta questa struttura è percorribile all'interno, non sono solo edifici, c'è una grande galleria con negozi, supermercati. E ecco, le, quello, quello che volevo comunicarvi è questo, cioè è, è, una, è, una, è, una, è una struttura che davvero induce un po' al gioco, al, al perdersi, al labirinto. Eh, certo, è profondamente antifunzionale, ma è proprio per questo che è stata concepita così, cioè si cerca quasi di indurre nel, nel passante o in quello che deve fare degli acquisti una, come dire, un gusto per il labirintico, per, per il perdersi nella città. Uh, qui vi do altre immagini, che come vedete c'è una certa attenzione al dettaglio, anche la forma delle finestre, tutto 
come dire, evoca poi la struttura generale fatta di tutti questi spigoli, di questi triangoli, eh, questo è un supermercato. Eh, anche le case all'interno hanno, riprendono questa, questo modulo, diciamo il triangolo, qui ci sono gli ingressi. Eh, quindi è un, è un tutto organico, concepito come tale, eh, in cui, ecco, quindi forse potremmo riassumere così, il brutalismo può diventare una struttura ludica e labirintica, um, giocosa, quindi come dire, quelle connotazioni di, di distopia, di pesantezza, quasi di pericolo che voi avete trovato in uh, Arancia Meccanica, per esempio, ecco, qui hanno tutta un'altra connotazione. E per finire, eh, guardate la differenza tra questa è, eh, allora, il municipio di Ivry-sur-Seine era, era ed è credo tuttora un municipio comunista, cioè eh, gestito dal Partito Comunista Francese, che negli anni 50 commissiona, questi sono alloggi popolari, questo tipo di struttura, ancora molto legata eh, diciamo, all'architettura degli anni 20, al, al costruttivismo russo, e 15 anni dopo questo tipo di struttura, guardate che, che, come dire, che cambiamento radicale, eh. Eh, non, non l'ho detto ma era quasi implicito, eh, mi, fa, mi ha fatto subito pensare, forse vi ha fatto pensare anche voi, ai, ai boschi, al bosco verticale no, di Milano, qui siamo in tutt'altro orizzonte, queste sono case popolari, però guardate quanto verde e, e forse appunto... Con meno, con meno marketing c'è una sorta di idea di, di bosco verticale qui. Comunque, eh, quindi il brutalismo, eh, qui in questo caso il brutalismo francese, eh, può essere a volte legato a anche dei momenti, a dei movimenti contestatori, controculturali eh, e a una dimensione ludica. Ecco, adesso per concludere voglio dedicare gli ultimi gli ultimi minuti di questo mio intervento a quello che è invece un aspetto fondamentale del brutalismo inglese, cioè le case popolari inglesi. Uh, council housing vuol dire sostanzialmente casa del, del comune. Eh, Nick mi aveva chiesto ecco, di precisare che si tratta di case pubbliche, questo deve assolutamente essere chiaro. Ora, um, diciamo così, il brutalismo inglese, come l'avete visto, si può eh, incarnare in degli edifici rappresentativi, in delle università, dei teatri, delle istituzioni, però in realtà eh, diciamo che in Inghilterra caratterizza soprattutto il numero elevatissimo di case popolari che viene costruito negli anni 50 e 60. Poi vi do un esempio molto famoso, nel nord dell'Inghilterra, Sheffield, queste sono, eh, questi sono edifici brutalisti, nel senso che, come vedete, l'immagine non è eh, delle migliori, ma insomma si intuisce. La, come, come nel caso di Le Corbusier, la struttura in cemento non è ricoperta, è quella che dà la forma e, al, e il colore all'edificio, ehm, che è questa sorta di serpentone, ci sono degli esempi forse simili in Italia, ma comunque insomma non voglio addentrarmi nella questione. Ora, eh, vista così, non so cosa ne pensiate voi, ma insomma potrebbe non essere un luogo così allettante. In realtà bisogna ovviamente contestualizzare. Innanzitutto si tratta di case popolari, quindi con eh, affitti calmierati, eccetera, eccetera. Però quello che eh, come dire, si trovava su questo appezzamento era questa cosa qui. Aspettate un attimo, adesso non fa, si è bloccato il PowerPoint. Uh, ecco qui, erano le eh, famigerate back to back, cioè questi edifici insalubri eh, che spesso risalivano all'Ottocento, con pochissimo spazio, fondamentalmente costituiti da due stanze, una al piano terra e una al piano superiore, senza verde, senza possibilità di stendere i panni, uh, quindi diciamo le, la, la casa del proletariato inglese di fino a 800, eh, negli anni 50 era vista come eh, assolutamente insufficiente rispetto agli standard moderni. Quindi 
Il eh, Labour Party, cioè il partito diciamo, socialista, per, per semplificare un po', eh, inizia una campagna di costruzione di case popolari fin da subito, fino dopo la guerra, che a, a volte assumono appunto questa forma. Ora, quello che voglio dirvi è quello che è diventato di Park Hill. Voglio mostrarvi cos'è Park Hill oggi. Park Hill, eh, proprio perché è stata fatta in un momento storico molto importante, da degli architetti importanti, è stata, uh, come dire, uh, rivalutata culturalmente, storicamente, è stata l'oggetto di un lungo lavoro di ristrutturazione e oggi si presenta più o meno così. Quindi qui vedete quello che vi dicevo prima, cioè ci metterò un trattato in vista. E voi vedete e capite immediatamente che qui stiamo parlando di un edificio che è sempre, cioè la cui struttura è la stessa, ma che in realtà eh, è abitato da persone molto diverse. Cioè, in realtà, cos'è accaduto? È accaduto qualcosa che si chiama right to buy. Cioè, il, eh, la Thatcher, cioè il, il, il governo eh, liberale eh, che si instaura alla fine degli anni 70 in Inghilterra, decide, ed è una delle primissime misure del governo di Margaret Thatcher, di vendere le case popolari. Cioè chi vi abitava, adesso uh, affronto lentamente tutti, tutti i punti che sviluppo in questa slide, chi vi abitava poteva acquistarle. Quindi, punto primo. Un milione e settecentomila abitazioni sono state vendute. Uh, dal 79, quando inizia questo scheme, si chiama così in inglese, cioè il right to buy, questa misura politica amministrativa, eh, il numero di case popolari diminuisce drasticamente, quindi da 6 milioni e mezzo a 2 milioni. Uno si potrebbe domandare, ma perché? Perché in realtà non vengono più costruite, cioè il governo dice ai comuni sostanzialmente di ridurre il proprio debito e di ridurlo vendendo le case. Eh, quindi i soldi che i comuni ricevono non vengono usati per fare manutenzione o per costruire nuove case popolari, ma per appienare il bilancio. La conseguenza qual è? Eh, beh, che, e qui ci siamo in due punti fondamentali, eh, a favore e contro, contro il right to buy. Cioè, alcuni dicono, beh, però, eh, appunto, eh, ora c'è una, un, una classe operaia inglese che è proprietaria di casa e quindi che la può vendere, la può, la può lasciare in eredità, eccetera, eccetera. Chi è contro, invece, fa osservare come ci sia una crisi dell'alloggio eh, gigantesca, che i prezzi siano esplosi, la, la price bubble, e che eh, in realtà sia avvenuto un fenomeno che è al, come dire, al centro della, di quello che sarà l'intervento di Nick Thoburn fra qualche minuto. Cioè, se, voi, eh, se il, questi grandi palazzoni brutalisti non, vengono più, eh, non, hanno, non fanno più l'oggetto di manutenzione da parte del comune perché sono privati, o generalmente privati, se, come dire... Eh, ci sono sempre meno case popolari, quindi chi ne ha diritto non è più la classe operaia, ma sono, sono le persone sempre meno abbienti, quindi le madri single, eh, le minoranze etniche che, che magari sono eh, senza, senza documenti o che hanno dei documenti ma non riescono a trovare lavoro, ehm, oppure appunto persone tossicodipendenti, eccetera, eccetera, o che hanno passato i tossicodipendenti. Cioè, quello che succede è appunto il fenomeno di ghettizzazione, cioè quelle che inizialmente negli anni 50 e 60 erano in realtà dei complessi piuttosto, come dire, mh, vivibili e, e che erano percepiti come tale, eh, negli anni 70-80 eh, e anche 90 subiscono una forma di, di, di decadenza, cioè le persone non vogliono più vivere lì, quindi vendono, eh, chi rimane lì sono quelli che non possono fare altrimenti e quindi diventano, come dire, eh, delle, delle, degli edifici che diremmo ghetto, cioè totalmente insalubri, eh, pericolosi e allora lì 
ritorno alla questione che si sollevava prima, cioè si incomincia a attribuire al brutalismo uh, la responsabilità di creare, di creare delinquenza, perché in questi grandissimi edifici, in questi lunghissimi corridoi può succedere di tutto e allora eh, si induce la delinquenza. Ma chiaramente le cose non stanno così, nel senso che eh, non è il corridoio che fa il delinquente o che crea il pericolo, però ecco, si incomincia a fare questo legame. E quello che a volte, in alcuni casi, era concepito come uno spazio ludico, complesso, in cui perdersi, diventa uno spazio in cui, questa è la retorica dell'epoca, il delinquente riesce a sfuggire alla polizia perché, perché ci sono degli spazi appunto labirintici complessi in cui non si può entrare e, e, e di conseguenza è più facile scappare, nascondersi, nascondere la droga, eccetera, eccetera. Quindi eh, il brutalismo iniziato con delle, come dire, il brutalismo inglese degli anni 60 con, eh, con una forma di emancipazione di, eh, di, una, di una classe operaia che in parte è al potere attraverso il Labour Party, diventa negli anni 80-90 eh, un'architettura stigmatizzata, l'architettura delle case popolari, quando le case popolari eh, in alcuni casi diventano dei ghetti. Questa è un po' una, delle, una parabola possibile del brutalismo. Io con questo ho terminato, adesso si tratta di capire se eh, Nick ci ha ragione. Vediamo una... yeah. Hi, professor uh, Thorborn, you are, are you here? I am, yes. yes. <laughs> Hi, Jacopo. Well, welcome. Hi, Nick. Uh, uh, Nick, I would, can you, can you put on your, your camera? Oh, yes. I put... It said, it says it's on. Let me turn it off and then on again, see if yeah. that... Yeah, you, 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 Nick, yeah, we can see you. Yeah, we can right. see you. We can see. So, Brilliant. uh, uh let, let me start the second part of our seminar after the introduction, uh, Jacopo, explained us the, the briefly what brutalism is. So uh, now uh, let me introduce Professor uh, Thorburn from University, Nicholas Thorburn from University of Manchester. But um, Jacopo will briefly uh, explain to our audience, which are PhD students, but students, colleagues and other people, uh, we who are, have a great interest in this subject in our department and in our university. So please, this is a seminar organized by the Collège International de Philosophie, the, the PhD program in architecture and design cultures of the University of Bologna. Please, Jacopo, uh, uh, give us a, a short, a brief information about Professor Thobur and then we'll begin his lecture to all of us. Okay. So, Jacopo, please. Okay, uh, I turned on my camera. Okay, Nick Thorburn um, is based in London, but um, he works in the University uh, of Manchester. He's a sociologist, and I, th I think this is extremely interesting and important because his paper is about architecture, culture, but he's the paper of a sociologist. So someone who's been looking at architecture not from the perspective of the history of architecture, or partly, but only partly, but most importantly, from the perspective of the sociology. So engage with the kind of cultural and sociological dimension of building. And I think this is extremely interesting. Um, just a few words about its previous publications. Uh, okay. Uh, Professor Thorborn published uh, a book Button in uh, 2003, which was about Marx and Pol Deleuze, Marx and politics, uh, which is the book I would strongly recommend. And although the title doesn't mention it, it's also a book about the Italian far left in the 60s and 70s. Um, his second uh, major uh, volume is anti book on the art and politics of radical publishing, which came out uh, with Minnesota in 2016. Uh, and this is uh, a book about, as the title clarifies, uh, a book about various forms of publishing from the, from the brochure to the magazine, 
And then again, uh, Professor Tobin's subject changes again, apparently. Now it's uh, the moment of architecture. So maybe, maybe Nick, why don't you tell us just very quickly why Deleuze, Marx and politics, then paper material and then architecture. Is there mm. kind of a connection? It's a good. Can you hear me? OK, uh, let yeah. me, you can. Yeah, yes, it's a, it's a bit of a, a jump around. I think I think through all my work, there's been an interest in form, the politics of form. So my uh, the form I call Marx and and Kind of socio-architectural form of Robin Hood Gardens, um, or put that differently, the Robin Hood Gardens as a mixture of different socio-architectural forms. So form has run throughout. I'd say Marxism has run throughout too, theoretically. Um, but yes, they are quite divergent projects. It keeps me okay. it keeps me interested. <laughs> Okay, I think you, you we can start, Nick. You have about an hour. Okay, uh, yeah. Make sure uh, you can show us your PowerPoint. Uh, Nick is not familiar with Teams, but uh, I think it's quite self-explanatory. There's a kind of um, arrow. square. Okay. Yes. A kind of there, arrow entering the right square. But so I, just I think so I request... Let me I have to request to the control, students. I think. I've just done that. Okay. So hopefully one of you. Uh, Andrea, uh, you need to somehow hand over to Nick to enable him to use to show us his PowerPoint. Yeah, but you have to look in the in the uh, on, up on the right of your screen. There is a small arrow entering a square. You open before uh, of it your file uh, in your on your desktop, and then you you click on the on the arrow, and the the, the file will enter. Yeah, this is good. I'm this I'm not your... sure whether it will give me. But you have to choose among the the among the file you have opened in your desktop. Okay, let's try. Let's try. Let me, while you are trying, let me remind to the students, other people listening to us, the title of your lecture, that's Savage Brutalism, Museums, Housing, Demolition, the Crisis, Artifacts of Robin Hood Gardens. This is the title. Can start. It might take a little while. It says, so I'm going into the security to allow screen recording. Um, it shouldn't, yeah, we, it shouldn't, it shouldn't we, be, it's, 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 it's the, the kind of, um, the icon next to the micro, Nick. Yeah, so when I, when I um, click that, it says yeah. I, they need permission to, to share my screen. So I've got to go to security and then screen recording. I know that sounds strange, but let's, I'll just see yeah, screen. We, you are now. Oh, ah, yeah. Uh, 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 and it's T. Ah, yes, it was turned off. Okay, so let's. Um, you have to select the, the to choose among your files opening on the desktop and click on it. Oh. Now, unless, wait a minute. We have lost him. Mm. He went away. <laughs> Not chip you. È uscito dal Andrea. Ma quindi chiunque partecipa può mostrare un PowerPoint. No, no, no. Avevo abilitato, l'avevo ah, già okay, abilitato perfetto. come te, come relatore, mentre quando ho visto che è arrivato. Il punto è che adesso è uscito proprio. 
Beh, adesso tornerà, speriamo. Eh, immaginiamo. <ride> cioè, eh. Per il momento non c'è. Si mi ha chiesto di, di rientrare, adesso gli ho dato l'ok, ok. dovrebbe riapparire. Però lo devo adesso... Ri... So, I, I'm back again, sorry about that, let me... Um... Wait a minute, I have to change your status into administrator again, as it was before. You're going out. You, are you again? No. Nicholas, where are you? Nicholas. What's going to show you? Where you need to? Here. So, so. So you have the status again, you can uh, enter your files if you have understood how to right. do it. Yes, let, let me try that again. Ah, oh, great, here we go. Brilliant. So yes, we are, we are seeing it, watching Thank your you. PowerPoint. You can see my PowerPoint, can you? Yeah, yeah. That's strange because I... Oh yes, here we go. Great. Is it um full screen or is it uh No, it's not it's not full screen yet. You have to choose in your in your Yeah, how, uh, how's how that? Much better, yeah. That's full screen. Yeah, that's full screen, yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. Good. Thanks uh Jacobo for that introduction and hello everyone. Uh it's lovely to be here albeit virtually. I'd like to thank Jacopo, Andrea Bossari and uh, Annalisa Trentin for uh, organizing the event and the University of Bologna and the College Internationale de Philosophie for uh, hosting me. Uh, my talk uh, this afternoon concerns a strange acquisition uh, by the Victoria and Albert Museum. Two interlocking apartments salvaged from the demolition of a brutalist council estate in East London, an estate called Robin Hood Gardens. This salvaged fragment was exhibited in part at the 2018 Architecture Biennale in Venice, part of an exhibition about Robin Hood Gardens called A Ruin in Reverse. And the fragment is now uh, being prepared as a major attraction for the planned v East Museum part of the vast culture and state-led regeneration of East London's former Olympic site. I'm going to argue that the V&A's fragment is a crisis artifact, a fraught and class-ridden artifact that is implicated in the demolition and the dispossession of working class housing estates, or what is known uh, euphemistically really as um, urban regeneration. The fragment confounds this interpretation, however, for its destructive effect is bound up with its capacity to appear not so, but rather to be a seamless artifact of modern architectural heritage. So to unpack this crisis artifacts form and its effects, which is the focus of this talk, I'll approach it in relation to two main themes. First, I want to show how the fragment converts estate demolition and the crisis of housing affordability into cultural history and civic exchange. And this part of the talk, I'll focus on the Venice uh, exhibition and the VNA director's public response to its critics. And I'll consider the exhibition film by the artist Doho Su. And then in the second uh, part, I'll consider the fragment as part of a regeneration trend that turns council housing into public art uh, in furtherance of regeneration. Here I'll look at some precedents of this council house art and consider the fragment in relation to the planned v East Museum. But first though, let me say a little bit about the estate uh, itself. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm currently uh, writing a book about its architecture and its lived experience in collaboration with the photographer Koyas Mir some of whose photographs I'll be showing through the course of this talk. Well, completed in 1972, Robin Hood Gardens was the only mass housing scheme designed by Alison and Peter Smithson, the London-based architects who coined the term new brutalism in the mid-1950s. 
Here they are with fellow brutalists, the photographer Nigel Henderson and the artist Eduardo Palozzi. Alison is in the middle right and Peter on the left. For the Smithsons, brutalism was an expressive architecture of exposed materials and structural elements and new architectural and urban forms. It was developed not as a once and for all style, but through critical and immersive and ongoing engagement with the social world. As the Smithsons put it rather beautifully in 1957, brutalism tries to face up to a mass production society and drag a rough poetry out of the confused and powerful forces which are at work. Up to now, brutalism has been discussed stylistically, whereas its essence is ethical. Well, this rough poetry had a singular articulation at Robin Hood Gardens. The estate was comprised of 214 apartments into sculptured and dramatic mid-rise concrete slab blocks of 10 and 7 storeys. The blocks had a large garden and an artificial mound between them, a stress-free zone, as the Smithsons called it, protected from the thunderous roads of the ex-industrial site of shipping docks. And as you can see here, the estate ended its life adjacent to London's second financial centre, uh, looming ominously in the background. Bent at plan, as the paired blocks hugged the territory of the garden and followed the roads, the architecture was most visibly characterised by the protruding rhythmic fins that vertically strode its exposed concrete facades, um, one of the numerous sound dampening features of the site, and its aerial walkways, uh, or known by the Smithsons as streets in the sky. Now, Robin Hood Gardens had long been subject to stigmatising uh, representations by government, culture industries, called a concrete monstrosity, uh, a trope you hear with monotonous regularity in, in UK discussion of, of um, brutalism and council housing. The features of this trope, concrete monstrosity, are ably illustrated by the Guardian newspaper's Simon Jenkins, who declared of this of Robin Hood Gardens in 2008. Never have the rich been robbed to dump so much concrete ugliness on the heads of the poor, Jenkins said. Uh, another example by the then Culture Ministry for the Minister for the Labour Party has it like this. Anyone who wants to save Robin Hood Gardens from demolition should try living there. It is simply not fit for purpose, and I cannot believe that anyone is trying to list it to save it. They should try living in it or raising a family there. And this uh, is the same again, third time from the uh, uh, Prime Minister David Cameron, the Prime Minister at the time, while making an obscene policy announcement to demolish 100 council estates. Step outside the worst estates and you're confronted by concrete slabs dropped from on high, brutal high-rise towers and dark alleyways um, that are a gift to criminals and drug dealers. The police often talk about the importance of designing out crime, but these estates actually designed it in, tells us uh, David Cameron. Well, all three of these quotations, uh, in Jenkins, Hodge and Cameron, they all feign solidarity with the working class residents of these estates. But in fact, this trope of the concrete monstrosity creates a public mood and a policy attitude that favours demolition of working class homes uh, to be replaced by private housing of greater economic value, uh, housing that is expelling working class uh, uh, Londoners from their city in staggering numbers. So a recent uh, estimate has 31,000 Londoners are facing the loss of their homes due to regeneration. And that is on top of the tens of thousands of council homes that have been demolished hitherto. So this is the cause uh, of the demolition of Robin Hood Gardens, uh, which began uh, in 2018 and is now half complete. At this point in the estate's history, something rather strange occurs. After decades 
a significant section of the culture industry decided that Robin Hood Gardens was not a concrete monstrosity, after all, but an architectural masterpiece. Destroyed as working class housing, it was to be rescued by the V&A as a work of art, a chunk of national heritage saved for the aesthetic pleasure of the museum going public. It is revealing of the class dimensions of this transmutation of Robin Hood Gardens that the first public outing of the V&A's fragment was a major stop on the circuit of global art and culture. So in 2008, the V&A had declined to support the campaign against demolition of the estate, but now, uh, with the estate demolished, the museum championed what they called this small section of a masterpiece, creating an exhibition about the estate at the Architecture Biennale uh, called A Ruin in Reverse. Considerably reduced in size to that which is proposed to the V&A East in London, the Venice exhibit comprised a section of street deck and balustrade supported by a facade fashioned from eight of the concrete fins, all assembled together with scaffolding and plywood. The construction allowed visitors, so it was claimed, to stand uh, on an original section of a street in the sky. The elevated access deck designed by the Smithsons to foster interaction between neighbours and promote community. It was accompanied by a panel display presenting a version of the vision, history and fate of Robin Hood Gardens and filmed interviews with critics and residents. And as a third feature, the v &A commissioned a 34 minute panoramic film by the artist Doho Su of the estate's interiors, uh, its architecture and its demolition. Later projected at vast scale uh, at the v &A in London. I'll come back to that film later on in the talk. So my question then is, how are we to understand this exhibited artifact? I want to approach it first in terms of what the Marxist critic uh, Walter Benjamin calls cultural history. Cultural history frames the museum audience, in Benjamin's words, as a public rather than a class. That is to say, its presupposition and its consequence is a representation of society as a cohesive, unified whole. Um, it is a representation that substitutes for the reality of class society, where, where working class experience is not cohesive, but is ever pulled out of shape by the conflictual social relations that condition and course through it. The working class has fraught social experience and as critical standpoint is in this way obscured um, and delegitimized by the discursive form of the public. Now for Benjamin, what goes for the subject of cultural history, the public, is true also for its objects. He writes that uh, the artifacts of cultural history are completed and reified, mere sediment wrested from the crisis-ridden flux of socio-economic relations and placed in a, a, a reified historical continuum. That is, uh, an integrated narrative of progress upon which class society or the public legitimates, uh, flatters and propels itself. The museum achieves these class cleansing effects while declaring its manoeuvre to be uh, neutral or non-political. So pulling off the trick of being simultaneously highly political and casting politicization as an illegitimate incursion. Evacuated of politics, of crisis and conflict, the declared function of the museum and its artifacts is instead to entertain, in Benjamin's words, to stimulate, to offer variety, to arouse interest, to relieve uh, monotony. Now, of course, we all need a little entertainment. Uh, it seems harmless enough. But Benjamin's point here is that the reified and entertaining artefacts of cultural history serve to close down uh, the potential of an artefact to reveal and challenge social crisis, to antagonise rather than consolidate the present, to bear, as he puts it, a consciousness of the present that shatters the continuum of history. 
Well, it was precisely such shattering of the reified artifact of the V&A's fragment that was attempted when a group of people in Venice and London, including myself, coordinated a simultaneous protest at the Biennale opening and at the V&A in London. A protest against regeneration uh, uh, and against the crisis of public housing framed here as an, an attempt to move to the VNA in London and claim back uh, the chunk for East London. Well, the, uh, the director of the VNA, Tristram Hunt, uh, didn't take kindly uh, to these protests, perhaps unsurprisingly. But what's interesting here is that his response uh, in a short essay in the art newspaper is a near perfect illustration of the class cleansing effects of cultural history and its public, where his text uh, lifts Robin Hood Gardens out of its conflictual uh, context in the present and embeds it in the historical continuum of the national public collection. We don't have time here to plot the steps of his arguments, but I will pick out one theme, uh, a, a key one, uh, and that is uh, the place in his justification of debate. Um, for this adds a crucial aspect to the depoliticizing effect of cultural history, debate. Despite Tristram Hunt's distaste towards those who politicized this fragment of estate demolition, he and the curators of the Venice exhibition know not to exclude the question of public housing. At the very least, it would look somewhat crass to exhibit a demolished artifact of council, council housing and to say nothing about council housing. And so uh, in Venice, uh, the fragment was presented rather wistfully as an opportunity uh, from the vantage point of a street in the sky to look to the future of social housing. And Jeremy Hunt, uh, the V&A director, presents the place of social housing in the exhibit like this, slightly longer passage. He says, where critics of the um, fragment are right to caution us to ensure our focus on design does not preclude context and that we avoid fetishizing architecture devoid of its social prehistory. That is why our pavilion in Venice forms part of a broader engagement with the question of social housing, which includes further debate at this year's London Design Festival and continued work with our near neighbors in North Kensington. Well, you might think that this disproves my argument for here, the V&A's fragment is drawing attention to class issues of social housing, when I've argued until now that it constitutes a public which obscures and delegitimizes class. So how are we to understand uh, this passage? I think in part, this association of the fragment with social housing is simply a palliative, a, a virtuous gesture with which visitors can identify should the social reality of estate demolition uh, disturb their pleasure in the exhibition. But there's more to it uh, than this, involving an effect of the museum artifact that is encapsulated in the following remark from Hunt in his delineation yet again of good museum neutrality from bad politicization. He says, I see the role of the museum not as a political force but as a civic exchange, curating space for unsafe ideas. I want to argue that in this civic exchange, conflict and crisis is rendered into conversation, conversation that overlays the demolition of council estates with a veneer of polite debate, debate fixed on a nebulous future and unhurried by without impact upon the pressing realities of today. The effect is made bluntly apparent in, uh, and slightly comically so too in this uh, agitprop for the Biennale uh, VNA protest, the London side of it. No more useless debates. But uh, keeping with um, Hunt's civic exchange, the content of this public conversation can sometimes be sympathetic to critical ideas. It's true. However, the form of civic exchange severs itself from and disdains political intervention. 
This is achieved not only in its stated neutrality, but more significantly in its expressive style and its legitimate subject. So if we were to read Hunt's response to the Fragments critics here, you would very clearly see his uh, cultivated air of dispassionate rationalism and objectivity, which he posits against the emotionality and the righteousness that he imputes to people who contest the civic frame of debate, contest contest that he deems illegitimate precisely because of its supposed emotionality. What we see played out here is the very form and function of the modern aesthetic, which, as David Lloyd contends, arises out of the necessity to forestall the revolutionary claims of its epoch and to substitute for the immediacy of political demands and practices an aesthetic formation of the disinterested and liberal subject. It's a subject that is constitutes itself in distinction from those who are deemed to be pathological for being bound to their passions, a position that Lloyd shows is racialized and classed. Conversely, the conflict that Hunt disdains in his opponents serves to empower the disinterested and depoliticizing public for the capacity to hold conflict in a shared community of cultural discourse is a foundational value and a confirmation of civic nationalism, a secularized guarantor of the sacred cohesion of the body politic, as Jacopo Gallimberti puts it. So let me pause. I'm conscious I'm running quite, this is <laughs> quite complex. So let me pause um, to summarize uh, thus far. So I've presented the V&A's fragment as an artifact of public uh, exhibition, where brutalist council housing becomes an object of cultural consumption. This consumption takes the form of a class cleansing public, uh, a public which favours uh, indefinite and apolitical conversation. And though it allows for some critical ideas, it establishes a disinterested liberal subjectivity. The public establishes a subjectivity which is racialized and classed. It is a subjectivity that disdains and delegitimizes the politics and subjectivities of those who would challenge its oppressive function, or in this case, it delegitimizes those who would challenge the demolition of council housing. Now I want to move now to consider how some of these features and some new ones are expressed in the form of the exhibit itself. I haven't said much about the exhibit, so I want to start bringing that in more from now on. And I'm going to focus uh, first on the, the V&A's exhibition film by the artist uh, Doho Su, a film whose title is the full postal address of Robin Hood Gardens. The film includes drone footage uh, of the exterior and demolition of the estate's west block. Remember, it's an estate built of two blocks. One of them was fully was being demolished when the film was made. Um, concentrates on the interiors of the yet to be demolished east block, a block that incidentally is still standing. Robin Hood Gardens is only half demolished. And the, the rest will be demolished within a year or two, we think. A disembodied camera eye tracks languidly up and across through four apartments, passing seamless, seamlessly through uh, floors and walls. Sue used uh, time-lapse photography and photogrammetry to achieve this effect, stitching together hundreds of images in fine-grained detail. The few residents of the estate that feature in the film, in its final scenes, sit silently and still in their homes, bearing a kind of ghostly, haunting affect that is accentuated as they fade into absence. In scenes, the photography is superimposed with uh, images from 3D scans, uh, glitches included. 
this effect confers an uncanny quality that resonates with the artist's previous sculptural works, consideration of which can assist analysis of the aesthetic form and reception of, of his film. Sue is well known, Doho Sue is well known for engaging with the form, memory and affect of home and displacement, of which one example can illuminate. This is Searle Home, LA Home, New York Home, Baltimore Home. It's a scale replica of the traditional Korean house that, that, the artist, that was the artist's childhood home, taking the form of a suspended diaphanous canopy of green silk. Its physical details exactingly reproduced in stitched seams. The detail situates the home in time, place and biography, but the work's insubstantial materiality also renders it an abstract, unsituated emblem, lifted out of particularity and made universal. As Francis Richard writes, and I quote, premised in autobiography, yet dematerialized to a lyrical husk, Searle Home appears as a scrim onto which anybody may project his or her reveries about any absent home. In this universalizing effect, mobility and translatability are key. Sue writes, I experience space through and as the movement of displacement. And this is encoded in the title of the work, which accumulates city names as it travels to each new site of exhibition. Seoul, LA, New York, etc., etc. This is not, however, a universal experience. Francis Richard continues, Sue's vision of an intrinsically transportable and translatable space takes for granted a world in which the peregrination of an artist who commutes between Searle and New York while preparing for exhibitions in Venice and LA makes perfect sense. In this, the work shares in a trend uh, for contemporary art to bear in its form the dynamics of capitalist accumulation. If we shift from Sue's universally mobile class uh, to the social conditions that constitute and enable the mobility of this class. It's a trend identified um, in the following way by Josephine Berry and Anthony Isles. They write, as with piazza, the piazzas, statuary and symbology of old, the public likewise bears the insignia of its master, capital. Its universalizing force of equivalence leaves an indelible impression on contemporary art as openness and interchangeability become some of its defining characteristics. Well, by stark contrast with so Doso Do Who's mobility, um, this is not at all the experience of ex-residents of Robin Hood Gardens, whose social lives do not accord with, but are made fraught uh, and insecure by the movement and translatability of capital. Their, house, their housing displacement is not chosen, but it's imposed. Their homes are pulled out of shape and security by class society. Now, it's true that Sue's film registers this difference in part. It features not an individual private house, but a council estate uh, in a scene of destruction, not portability. Uh, the interiors are symbolically coded as working class. And the homes in their mundane detail are evidently long inhabited, not interchangeable. A situatedness conferred also by the film's title. Yet these features are not invested with aesthetic or narrative consequence. They aggregate only into a, a vague um, filmic quality of mourning. And this quality doesn't challenge but contributes to the film's languid, disembodied, haunting mood. A mood which neutralizes this fraught site of displacement while delivering it to the transportable aesthetic of contemporary global art. Uh, the aesthetic of capital and its favored class masquerading as a universal form. Now I think this aesthetic 
described in, in Sue's, uh, Doho Sue's film, um, is encapsulated in a one promotional photograph for the uh, Venice exhibition. Two people uh, are seated in the Biennale warehouse come gallery, watching Sue's film in a relaxed manner. Their commanding gaze soaking up an expansive panorama of housing destruction. The estate's exterior is ripped off, yet it's rendered to them and to the universal public that the film interpolates as beautiful and haunting, framed by a glorious urban sunset. OK, that's that's the film. But what of the fragment itself? Well, in this second part of my uh, talk, I want to discuss the fragment, not at, as it appeared in Venice, uh, but in its emerging manifestation at the V&A East, which is part of the post-Olympic regeneration of East London, a regeneration called, well, a cultural industry called East Bank, which is part of the regeneration. Very different to the Venice exhibit, I suggest. The plan at the V&A East is to fully reconstruct two whole apartments with their original fittings. Uh, you can see them, you can see these apartments indicated hopefully on the screen by the dotted lines. This is one of the V&A's um, promotional photographs. So these two apartments which interlock are going to be reconstructed scale, going to be placed inside um, the museum, the new museum as a permanent exhibit, which one of course can walk through. Now, I want to suggest that this fragment, or this fragment as it will be reconstructed, is to be understood as an example of the public art of regeneration, or more specifically, what I'll call um, council house art. A curious development in, the, in public art that is closely allied with the development industry. The first of these two forms is associated with the first phases of any regeneration. Uh, where it serves to fabricate residents' consent for the yet-to-be-demolished site. And the second form, council house art, serves as marketing and placemaking for the new development. It occurs during and after demolition. So if we start with the first form, the public art of regeneration, its features and consequences are delineated uh, by Josephine Berry in her recent book, Art and Bare Life. Berry identifies a mode of public art on sites of impending demolition and working class displacement, council estates in particular, that emerged with the embrace of culture-led regeneration by the UK's new Labour governments from 1997. It seeks to involve this art seeks to involve working class residents in different kinds of cultural representation, taking the dematerialized and participatory form of relational art and socially engaged art. It provides a measure of participation and social inclusion for residents at the moment of their imminent expulsion. As Berry um, concisely puts it, it's a way to include the socially, the so-called socially excluded into fields of action or theatres of meaning whose horizon, and here's the rub, is retained as art. Uh, this is the cynical logic of using art to heal social wounds while worsening them. Now, a much espoused value of this uh, public art is community, where artists fabricate totemic symbols of communities for populations that are undergoing traumatic transformation and disintegration at the hands of the very parties who are funding the artwork. It's not to say that such community participation must be especially successful um, for the work to succeed, for it serves the development industry primarily as public relations um, 
a representation of community consent. And I think we all know, we've, we've encountered examples of this, where the artwork is, is not particularly convincing and no one really believes that the community has brought into it. But I'm saying that that doesn't really matter for its purpose is to display consent. Or as the group um, Southwark Notes encapsulates the function, the artist claimed to be engaged in the process of making the community visible, while the developer uses this process to demonstrate that the community is visibly engaged with the process of regeneration. Well, that kind of art, that public art of regeneration, uh, is for the pre-demolition phase, when the working class communities are still inhabiting the space. Once the demolition begins, uh, the second form of developer-funded developer public art emerges, what I'll call um, the council house, sorry, what I'm calling council house art. Uh, this art retains a participatory quality, but it now takes artifactual form, where the physical architecture of council estates becomes the art, um, usually in some state of destruction and almost always in a spectacular or massive uh, form. Now, the famous uh, forerunner of this is Rachel Whiteread's uh, 1993 work, House, where her trademark negative casting took the form of a freestanding concrete block of the inside space of a demolished terrace house in London. You know, the, the, the house was sealed up, concrete was poured in, and then the walls of the house were pulled away to reveal this structure. Uh, more recent is, Ro is Roger Huon's work, Seizure, an installation fashioned from a council flat in Southwark, South East London. Part of a post-war block being readied for demolition. Here, the full interior of a three-room flat was sealed and filled with 75,000 uh, litres of copper sulphate solution, which crystallised over three weeks to generate startling surfaces of encrusted vivid blue crystal throughout the flat. Now, I think both in, 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 in Seizure and in, in, in Whitefleet's house, even the process of production has that spectacular, massive quality to it. The volume of concrete, the volume of, of, um, of copper sulphate solution and so on. But also the work itself has, a, has a, a, a kind of spectacular quality, if only because of its great size and the anomalies of filling a house with blue crystal or filling a flat a house with concrete. Well, both uh, House and Seizure were commissioned by Art Angel, a major arts organisation specialising in spectacular site-specific public art. Art Angel's board of trustees includes property developers, fund managers and founders of private equity firms. These are the drivers, of course, and the beneficiaries of council estate demolition and regeneration. Art Angel also commissioned a 2013 work by Mike Nelson. Uh, it was ultimately unrealized due to opposition from residents and campaign groups, but they planned to construct an enormous pyramid or ziggurat from the demolished homes of South London's Haygate estate, uh, the site of a notorious regeneration where 1,212 council homes have been replaced by a development of double that size, but of which only 92 flats are for council level rents. Now I said the first form of the public art of regeneration aims to create the impression of residents' consent uh, for the demolition of their homes, but what work is being performed by the second form? You know, this spectacular council house art. As I noted, it's funded by the development industry uh, at some expense. So I think we can safely assume that it aims to further the agenda of regeneration and the expulsion of uh, working class residents. But how does it do this? Well, what House and Seizure and if it had occurred, the Haygate Pyramid all perform is the rebranding or the resignification of the site, sometimes called placemaking. These works erase the site's association with council estates and the working class 
and begin to establish the site as one of high value investment, um, high value housing and arts and culture. And it's significant for this effect that the council house art is spectacular because the, the sort of wow effect attracts great public and media attention and establishes a clear cut uh, with the past, a clear transition that is at once announced and experienced in the artwork itself. There's sometimes a, a participatory element in this art, but the participants are no longer the working class residents that we saw in the earlier form of the public art of regeneration. Rather, the participants for these works are the ideal audience with which to market the new homes to speculative investment companies. So the audience, which is the art and museum going public, they may not be able to afford um, the new houses either, but they're the right image with which investment companies can market uh, the new housing to, to investors. And yet you may well ask, if the aim is to destroy the working class associations of these development sites, why on earth are they choosing working class housing for their object of the art. You know, surely they want to immediately hide the working class housing and choose some other artifact to focus on. It does seem quite strange, but I suggest that there are three uh, reasons for it. Reasons which are interrelated, but that also work in different ways, segments of the um, consuming public. First, these artworks provide that haunting sense of absence that I argued was key to Doho Su's film about Robin Hood Gardens. Um, that is to say, the feeling that a community uh, has passed and indeed the feeling that working class urban community is a thing of the past. Something to be uh, in these artworks, visitors mourn the absence of the working class from the side. Had, but and living. Second, these artworks uh, provide cultural heritage uh, for the site. We know that the development industry loves a bit of local class contoured heritage to market its new developments. Um, this heritage role is typically taken by historical industry, industrial quarters, shipping docks, uh, canals, um, where it's usually located on site that are long vacated by industry's conflictual class conditions. But in the examples we're considering, council house art, the heritage fashioning of the working class occurs in the place and the time of its expulsion, raw with the housing crisis and still warm from the bodies of those who used to call it home, as Anna Villanica puts it. You might ask then, isn't it risky for developers to use council housing in this way? And I think it is. Uh, I indicated already that local opposition, or I indicated already the local opposition provoked by the Haygate pyramid and the V&A's fragment, but it's also the clearly evident social violence of council estate demolition that for developers necessitates this art, arguably necessitates these attempts to turn the most visible object of social violence into its apparent opposite through, as I've described, uh, pseudo participation, haunting absence, spectacle, class heritage and so forth. Now, there's a third effect of this council house art um, or a third effect that's positive for regeneration. Uh, one that operates at a more unconscious um, level and concerns the fact that these works always in some way feature destruction. Recall that these council estates are all too frequently described as monstrous, as concrete monstrosities, as we saw at the beginning. Um, although it's the concrete that's called monstrous, I suggest that the vehemence by which this accusation is made indicates that the word concrete serves to disguise and disavow what is the real object of fear and hostility, and that is the social form and visibility of the working class estate. 
If that's true, then these artworks of housing destruction fulfil a cathartic and sadistic uh, pleasure, a symbolic destruction of the working class monster that comes with the actual destruction of working class homes. Now, of course, these works, um, like the V&A's fragment, often claim to be co commenting constructively. Excuse me. <clears throat> on the social situation of council housing. But as Christopher Jones contends, when they do comment, uh, when they do make comment on, on council housing, they tend to show an extraordinary degree of insensitivity and cack handedness uh, and reproduce the discourse of regeneration, even if unwittingly. So if we take seizure as an example, in Art Angel's contextualizing interview with the artist, he presents the claustrophobia of his crystalline grotto, uh, as he puts it, forever growing inwards, an unrelenting, unknowing chemical activity going deeper inwards. He presents this in an homology with the supposedly stifling effects of council housing, which in his words, provided no room for movement, zero mobility to move further. Council houses are completely static uh, materially and emotionally. Now, I think this is the integral meaning of a uh, seizure, which visitors were invited to experience and co-produce in their cramped shuffle through the flat. 25,000 of them uh, in the first three months alone, some queuing for hours uh, to enter. Well, the problem here is not that seizure misunderstands the crisis facing council housing, although it does. Um, worse than that, it perpetuates a truism of regeneration. The lie that council housing is a blockage to individual expression and social mobility. And so it legitimizes, legitimizes demolition. Seizure legitimizes a major cause of housing inequality and crisis that it claims to reveal and challenge. Now, equipped with these uh, features of council house art, I'll turn to consider um, the v &A's fragment in a, in a last uh, brief part uh, of my talk. So th <clears throat> the v &A, uh, is very quick to highlight that its salvage work on Robin Hood Gardens was conceived of long after the estate was earmarked for demolition. And that's true. But when the fragment shifts from its site of demolition, which is Poplar in East London, to its future setting at the planned v &A East Museum, also in East London, a mile or so away, when it makes that shift to the new site, it becomes a leading attraction in a vast culture and state-led regeneration. Here, it's no longer possible for the v &A to claim that it has nothing to do with the demolition and regeneration, or rather to claim that the fragment has nothing to do with demolition and regeneration. The v &A East, this, this representation of the museum you see there, uh, will sit at the nexus of four of London's poorest boroughs, or what in marketing speak, the v &A describes as four of the city's fastest growing and most diverse boroughs. The claim, as always, is that the development will bring inward investment and culture that will elevate the lives of its existent uh, inhabitants. The reality, however, is that the massive house building programme that has accompanied this culture led regeneration has served to demolish uh, working class estates and raise land values significantly and hence rents. And so it produces the opposite of what is claimed. One of the Olympic boroughs, Newham, has the highest rate of homelessness in the UK. Homelessness that is not addressed, but is exacerbated by the acres of new apartment blocks that are being built in the regeneration. But what has the v &A's fragment got to do with this? Like the other examples of council house art uh, that we've looked at, the v &A's fragment is fashioned by and facilitates the East Bank regeneration. 
Now, of course, it's not yet installed. The museum is not yet built. But I think we can confident, confidently foresee in it the features of council house art that I've described thus far. In, especially if we draw also from some of the features of the Venice uh, exhibition. <clears throat> we know already that the accompanying film constructs the haunting mood of lost community, which releases the estate from its particularity as working class housing into an artifact of mobile global culture. And it's not difficult to imagine that the structure itself will accentuate this feature, a furnished but uninhabited block of working class housing, saved from demolition, but now voided of its community, its inhabitants, its context and its purpose. A haunting, that's what I'm suggesting then, you know, a kind of haunting kind of housing artifact in the middle of this museum. It's also quite clearly a, a spectacular, uh, massive work, a feature registered already in its media reportage, so helping to usher in the shift of the meaning or branding of this new site, this regeneration site. And finally, the fragment offers the placemaking power of working class uh, heritage, the heritage of council housing. This heritage, I think, has two or will have two interrelated functions. First, it feigns solidarity with the working class and so helps flatter and legitimate the development's class cleansing future. The historical continuum of cultural history that, as we saw, uh, that Walter Benjamin diagnosed at the beginning of the talk. You know, in identifying with, with the history of the working class, the, 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 the exhibit and hence the museum is able to suggest a continuity of change rather than a, 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 an experience of crisis and, 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 and the fraught class conditions. That's how the that's how the, uh, the the fragment will help propel the VNA into the future. But if we look in the other direction, uh, the second function I think uh, is that this working class heritage will help relegate the working class to the past. It helps take the working class and an appreciation of class crisis out of the present and embalm it uh, as a neatly curated bygone community. The VNA's fragment then is a past to ground a future ever evacuated of the conflictual present. And uh, on that point, uh, I'll end. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Nick. I think uh, if we were alive, you would uh, hear a big round of applause now. And it's always very weird to end a talk without uh, this noise, isn't it? it it's good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad, I'm glad that it was, I'm glad to have it reported and applauded. <laughs> At some point, there were about 145 people listening to you. Great. So I think great. they would have been quite noisy. Um, okay. Um, Andrea, if you don't mind me um, leading this, this uh, part, I would. I mean, I would, I would, I would, how does it work in with teams? If people have questions, they can raise their hands, right? Yeah, but uh, I think that uh, since some people, the, the part of the people are attending this afternoon lecture since uh, three hours, because they started at one, I suggest to have a, a very short break, 10 sure. to 10 minutes, and then beginning the, 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 the debate, the discussion uh, with the hand and so on. Okay, brilliant. So we'll reconvene in 10 minutes. No more than 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank, Thank you okay. anyway, Thank Professor Thorborn, for your very interesting presentation. Thank you. See you in, in, in 10 minutes. minutes. Bye. Bye-bye. Hi, Nick. How did you feel about, about the lecture? Uh, well, it's a, you know, it's a strange experience talking, giving a lecture when you can't see who you're speaking to. But no, it, it worked fine for me. Um, yeah, no, and I mean, it was, it was a nice to have the chance to, to, to give it. It's the first time I've given uh, the talk on, um, on, the, on the fragment. <laughs> it, it seemed very thorough, very 
um, ready for publication, really. Um, Good. Good. Very Great. outstanding. Um, I just wanted to say something about the, the audience. Uh, it's mostly uh, made of, um, I mean, I guess, I don't know. Th th there should be about uh, 20 to 30 PhD and postdoc students. Might be related to the Department of Architecture or a few of them are philosophers or from the political science or yeah, political science department, but the vast majority are students um, who um, attended design course, I think it's mostly uh, aspiring designers. So I think you really, uh, I think your approach was very uh, interesting and productive because it was not only about architecture, but really uh, the kind of cultural production of, of the artifact that was mm -hmm. really important, I think. Um, let's see. And also the artistic artifacts you you showed are very eloquent. Are you um, presumably in Italy? You're familiar with um, White Reed's house, or what? I mean, I've seen it, but uh, I've seen it, but uh, I don't know whether you know. I can't. Um, I immediately thought of uh, God Mata Clark. Yes, right. Yeah. Uh, way, who began early on, like in the mid seven, early seventies, but faced actually see very similar problems. He was a, I mean, he had a very, let's say, formalistic approach to the buildings he worked with, and didn't really. It was, it was. I mean, his work precedes the advent of um, public art of regeneration, and mm. it's, it's. Although you know that there must be there must be some a link of some sort. I don't know. This is something that you might you might mention in your book. Yeah, uh, yeah. I hadn't thought uh, about the link with him because I, I I kind of I know very little about Matter Clark, so I like to think of him as an artist that I like. So I I have to kind of reflect on that a little. I'll, bit. I'll send you an article, uh, which should be unpublished by one of our colleagues in the art history department. She's no longer uh, at the, uh, in the art history department of Man Manchester, but she used to be. Uh, and it was all about how Mata Clark basically ignored, for example, the, the gay community in New York mm. and who actually used some of the buildings, mm. decaying buildings he, he wanted to work on. And so he actually destroyed what was actually you know, uh, uh, a spot of the gay community. Right, okay. I'll send you the article. Yeah, please, yeah. Yeah, the 10 minutes are over, and I think we can start our debate, and uh, who wants to ask questions or to clarify some aspect of the presentation, both of them, even the first one introducing the, the subject. Uh, Andrea, are you, were you asking me or the public? Sorry. No, I'm asking the public since the public, okay. you were, your, your private talk was very public <laughs> till now. So you, your exchange yeah. was uh, listened by 100 people and 20. Yeah. Vale. So there is someone who is asking, that Valentina, yeah, please, Valentina, uh, you, you, you may ask. Well, did you want to turn on turn on the camera? Yeah. Hi, hi everybody, and thank you very much, uh, Thorburn and Mr. Thorburn, for your exposition. I found it uh, really interesting and inspiring. And I have a question for you, and then a question for uh, for Jacopo. Well, first uh, for you, Mr. Thorburn. And uh, but I, let me please uh, just uh, first of all introduce my question. Say, saying that uh, I found uh, really interesting your analysis, pointing out that uh, if we separate uh, brutalism from uh, its uh, class dimension, 
brutalism lost uh, its uh, uh, peculiar political characterization. And in fact, you talked about a class cleansing effect. So uh, brutalism became, becomes something that is no longer connected, or better, I would say, historically connected to the working class matrix, to the working class life, or uh, we could say to the uh, working class, uh, um, the working class experience. So uh, if that's happened, brutalism uh, became something that uh, is functional to regeneration, to spe uh, speculation, to what we can uh, name as refusionization. So uh, in a similar condition as you, I think that you really good pointed out, uh, brutalism undergoes uh, a depolitization. So I think you have fully grasped the point that makes uh, uh, brutalism such a fascinating experience, which of course is not just a matter of form, a matter of style, is both uh, aesthetics and both ethics, would have said Banam. But you also let it be understood that, that talking about brutalism means talking about an experience of class architecture. So my question is, and what about Manfredo Tafuri? So what's the relation between your analysis and the famous Tafuri assertion that there is something like there is no class architecture, but only a class criticism of architecture? So that's my first question for Mr. Tauber. And the second question is for, uh, for Jacopo. And thank you very much also to you for your very good presentation of what brutalism is. And my question is just, uh, um, I just would like to, to ask you if we, you could define the difference uh, between functionalism and brutalism. Because you said that uh, one of the uh, first cornerstones of brutalism is Le Corbusier uh, Unité d'Habitation. But uh, as we know, Le Corbusier is one also one of the father of functionalism. And uh, when you were talking about uh, Les Etoiles of uh, Jean Renaudie uh, in Ivry-sur-Seine, you talked about uh, a deeply anti-functional architecture. So just to explain better, so I think that it could be interesting to uh, better understand what brutalism is to to make the difference, or to point out uh, the difference between uh, brutalism and functionalism. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. We will collect some questions, or would you like to answer? You wish to answer now? Shall we answer now? Yeah, I think so. Do you want to go first, Jacopo? Uh, yeah, very quickly. Um, yeah, I mean. The unité d'habitation is a, is a benchmark of brutalism uh, because of its use of uh, concrete. Um, fun, uh, sorry, brutalism um, is not uh, antithetical to functionalism, but in many respects, it continues uh, modernist architecture. And, and I mean, uh, of course, I mean, th there's a transition, of course, uh, World War II um, changed the kind of the material culture radically, and yeah, um, I, I, functionalism and it, even a sort of a, a kind of pragmatism is is not at all alien to brutalism. Uh, this is not always the case. In, in the case of Renaudie, the the, the 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 blocks I showed you are clearly anti-functionalist, clearly. Uh, focus on on um, the valor valorization of the lab, the, the kind of the maze, the labyrinth, the, the, and also the the kind of plate-like dimension of, of strolling in a in a in a large city. So I think uh, it really depends on on what kind of um, brutalism we're talking about. But it's very difficult to generalize. I think in many many ways. Uh, functionally, is, is not antithetical to, to brutalism, which which mostly describes uh, a, a way in which materials and, and structures are treated. Um, in the, yeah, I, I think I don't know whether I hope this uh, replies to your question, Nick. 
Okay, yeah, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, so I didn't catch the name of the questioner, but that was they were two lovely questions. So thank you. <laughs> uh, so one is about um, the class dimension of brutalism and it's uh, and it's uh, the revival of interest in it. And the other is about Tafuri and class architecture. So I'm very pleased to be asked about Tafuri at a talk uh, in Italy. That's great. Um, yeah, so part of, I guess, a core part of my project on Robin Hood Gardens is to bring the problematic of class into talking about brutalism in a way that isn't the old welfare state story that essentially says there was a period in the, you know, in the sort of post-war period where the working class were well provided for with modernist housing. And that's about it. And we should celebrate that moment in history and leave it there. Uh, I think, I mean, there are obvious reasons for doing that because, you know, the trashing of this housing has left people in such a dire state. But I think class is a so much more complex and political category than that model allows. And so I'm interested in seeing how the class conditions that we have today, where which is, you know, this what I was saying in the talk, this kind of fraught and crisis ridden experience, not an identity, but a crisis ridden experience, how that can be used to think about brutalist form as well as the experience of housing. Um, or maybe to say that more, to be more specific, how that can be used to think about Robin Hood Gardens, because I, as Jacopo was saying, I think brutalism it can I think it's a useful term but also it's it covers a pretty wide variety of styles and and and, and ethics and the, Alison and Peter Smithson have a very particular take on this one that I, I think is very very interesting now with that said you're absolutely right that what's happened in recent years is that brutalism has 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 become a um, a sort of fashionable style you know in coffee table books um, in sort of in in it yeah in sort of coffee table books let's let's leave it like that um, which has kind of separated the art the, the the aesthetic or the style away from the politics the ethics um, and some of the writing in this area says ah oh, yeah but the real architecture is the style and the ethics is simply the welfare state and that sure that's that's relevant, but it's nothing to do with the architecture. I think that's completely wrong. I think the architecture in its most interesting is also social. It is also infused with problems of class, problems of industry, problems of social space and so on. Um, and so, yes, I agree. I think if we fetishize the architecture in separation from its social relations, we lose what's interesting about the architecture as well as losing the politics. The question then is, how do you talk about the social relations in brutalism? And as I said a minute ago, I think you don't do it by simply celebrating the welfare state, which is how most people do it. I think it's more complex than that. And that's why I'm interested in this problem of class architecture. Um, and that leads to your second question about Tafuri, who, of course, you know, has this amazing, Jacopo and I have talked about this quite a lot, this sort of amazing phrase that seems to at once that seems to remove the possibility of um, a class architecture. You know, there is no class architecture until after the revolution. Um, and yet, albeit that I'm pushing to Fury against himself, I think it, it's interesting to read that as a refusal of any kind of identity to class architecture, any utopia of class architecture, any idea that architecture simply arrives and solves social problems. And so it's a in a kind of Deleuzean or a Marxist frame, I'd say it's a sort of imminent, um, self-critical, creative and destructive approach to what ar architectural form can be. Um, and so I like Tafuri there, even though I, you know, I admit I'm um, reading him a little. I'm not. I don't think I'm reading him against himself, but clearly it's not quite the <laughs> the intention of that passage. Um, because then, if I explain that a little bit more, it's because for me. Uh, and this is kind of my my Marxism. Um, the working class is not and never has been and absolutely isn't today an identity that can be achieved. It has to be about self-abolition. That's communism, the self-abolition of the proletariat. Now, if that can happen within, if that happens as a sort of movement or a force within capitalism, 
then why can it not also happen in relationship to spatial uh, form, built form? Now, of course, the big block to that is the fact that building costs so much money. And that's Jameson's point, that it's the most expensive, it's most capitalist of arts because it costs so much money. Nevertheless, I think it's possible within architecture to, to sort of, you know, to, to try and wrench away certain um, features of, of, of capitalist identity. And so I think Tafur is interesting, but I am slightly, I'm, I'm pushing it in a different way, but I think it's, I would argue, actually, it's more Marxist to do that because it engages with a politics imminent to capitalism. Otherwise, you're left saying nothing can happen till after the revolution, um, which seems a slightly strange way of framing politics to me. I hope that helps. So thank you for this answer too. Someone else would like to ask something to Professor Thoburn. Even in Italian, we can translate the questions if you don't dare to speak English. Oh, sorry, this is uh, Amir speaking. I, I was trying raising my hand, but it didn't work. So can I just uh, start? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I will turn on my camera. Please, uh, Amir, ask. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Nick. It was great. Thanks. I think also it was very good to have this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, lectures in the Department of Architecture in Bologna because, uh, uh, I mean, the, I used to work in the department and we were working a lot on uh, culture-led uh, regeneration. Ah. So I think it's very much, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's very useful, I think, to, uh, to give this kind of insight in this context. And uh, actually, I had a question on brutalism, um, and, but actually, um, I have some problems uh, um, to see it as a form of, uh, you know, working class aesthetics. Right. Because actually, I, I really see it uh, as, um, you know, a very bourgeois uh, idea of uh, maybe uh, this kind of attempt, of course, this bourgeois interest towards uh, the working class or towards conflict and towards, uh, you know, uh, certain uh, parts of society that you can't really understand, but uh, in a way you try to aestheticize it. And do you think uh, that we can see it also as a sort of culturalization of conflict, as a sort of representation of class through, through art? Um, so in, in this sense, I would say that brutalism already was uh, maybe from the beginning, uh, this kind of operation of culturalizing working class, and then perhaps working class has reappropriated this sort of uh, artifact, this sort of, uh, form of uh, I mean, th these specific forms, uh, but uh, as a later, in a way, reappropriation. So this was my, my first question. And then I had another question on, uh, on the art scene and uh, the interests uh, uh, of the art scene towards uh, uh, critical theory. I think now uh, critical theory is actually made into art institutions. Uh, actually, artists are the main readers uh, of uh, critical theory, and they use pretty much uh, uh, critical theory in their artworks. Uh, do you think this is just uh, Again, uh, a, a bourgeois uh, kind of interest towards critical theory or a fe guilt uh, feeling that, uh, you know, uh, we all have and we want to do something and maybe the easiest way is to do it uh, into the art world, perhaps also because the art world, as you said, is very much interested in critical theory as a topic, uh, as a content but not really, you know, in the forms uh, in which art is produced. And do you think actually there is sort of way of uh, doing some, uh, or making art uh, political and not just uh, aestheticizing politics? Mm. Thank you. Great. Yeah, OK. Uh, so the fir your first question, uh, which picks up very nicely from where, uh, you know, the last discussion left off concerns whether brutalism 
if you like, is or isn't a working class architecture. And you're absolutely right to say it would be wrong to simply call it a working class architecture. Um, it isn't, you, you know, you're right. First of all, it emerges uh, within, you know, a capitalist economy. It, it costs huge amounts of money to to build. Um, it was mostly constructed, or at least with the Smithsons, it was constructed by, you know, typically kind of bourgeois um, a couple who were definitely not Marxists. People sometimes think of them as Marxists. They probably, they, I don't think they were even socialists. Um, you know, they make some vague comments towards socialism sometimes, but on the whole, they're sort of apolitical as they understand it. Um, so brutalism isn't Marxist or isn't working class. Even the Smithsons aren't at all Marxist. But I think my argument is that if we understand class to be this condition of crisis and fragmentation, which it absolutely is, um, I don't. I, I mean, we could talk about that, but I don't think there's any doubt about that today. Um, then there are ways of understanding how Robin Hood Gardens almost, well, how Robin Hood Gardens does actually produce certain kinds of, I don't know, architectural response to that class condition. It doesn't produce it because the Smithsons intended to, it produces it because the Smithson's methodology was actually really in tune with the kinds of things that class analysis should be in tune with. Um, primarily because it was concerned with decent housing uh, and urban living, which are, you know, clearly major class uh, concerns. Um, so it produces a class architecture because of its methodology, but not because of the intention of its, of its architects uh, and neither because brutalism, as you say, is somehow class architecture. It isn't. I agree with you. And I think it's, I think many people miss that. They think that it is. Um, so so I, that would be my answer to that point. Um, in terms of the kind of, in terms of a sort of bourgeois um, interest in the working class, that's always been a feature of, you know, the arts, the humanities, the working class has supplied um, um, all sorts of emotional and aesthetic and, and thematic content for middle class uh, consumers, writers, critics, academics. Um, but I don't think that in and that's something that we should be really, really conscious of. But I don't that think that in itself is a reason for for critics, let's say, who are structurally middle class or, you know, whatever class they are, it, it, it doesn't, it's not a reason for them not to engage with the problem, the problematic field of the working class. I mean, that's the, that's, for me, that's Marxism. It, it must be immersed in, in an understanding of class society, which is not to say that you kind of, you know, I don't know, you go to the factories or you, you start wearing stereotypical workers' clothing or all of these things that the left traditionally has done. It's not that. It's that, as Marx says, it should be from the standpoint of the abolition of labour. I should adopt an understanding of class society is key to how it works. Um, and then, so, then, and oh yeah, sorry, and then your, your point about culturalization. I think that's very interesting. Um, so I think some of the brutalist architects, maybe the Smithsons are one of them, or, had a romantic or fetishized idea about what the working class, what working class culture is, um, which is not what I'm saying class is, but you know, they had this idea of what working class culture is, um, and thought that their housing could sort of fulfill a role for that romantic idea of class. And of course it didn't, you know, one of the famously Robin Hood Gardens was partially vandalized as soon as it was opened. Um, Alison Smithson wrote an awful essay uh, against the vandalism of Robin Hood Gardens, um, where she basically said the working class haven't understood middle class values, and so they've just become vandals. We've given them too many goodies to consume, and now they're throwing it back in our face. That kind of thing is awful. I mean, you you know, it's come from a, someone who's hurt that her new building has been vandalised, but it's still an awful analysis. So I think, yes, there was a kind of culturalization among some brutalists, um, which again, going back to my earlier point, doesn't mean that you can't see 
elements of brutalism as pushing the problem of class through architecture. And then your your last point about about art and theory, um, art practice and theory. I mean, if, you know, it's it's true, of course. You know, where do you find the best theory uh, books? It's it's if the, if it's in a bookshop, it'll be in an art gallery um, or a decent art gallery. Um, well, I I I in I think I'd answer that in two ways. I think in some ways it's brilliant that art, art practitioners. Uh, and artists are interested in in complex social theory. You know, personally, I think it would be great if even more people were. But I, I like that they are. I like that they make use of it. Um, there are two problems with that. One of which it simply becomes like an aesthetic without any purchase on practice. I mean, I don't mean art practice, but political practice. Um, and of, you know, of course, that's a problem with contemporary art, as it is with the academy as well. Um, the other problem, I think, is when the theory is mobilised for well, when the theory hasn't really been understood. Now, I'm wary of saying that. I don't mean that everyone should have perfect understanding of theory before they use it. But you know, when the theory is so misunderstood that it's used to support something that it really is that it's almost opposed to. Um, and if we abstract from that to think about that house seizure, I don't think Roger Hjorns, the artist who filled the, the house full of um, uh, blue cobalt, I don't think he is much of a, a theorist. I don't think, I don't know, but I don't imagine he claims he reads much theory. But if you kind of pull back from high theory to social uh, critique, he claims to be producing social critique in that house. That's the claim of that work, except it's a social critique that actually boosts regeneration with all of that rubbish about council housing, limiting people's possibilities. Um, and so I think that one is when it becomes really problematic, when theory or social engagement or social practice uh, claims, and this is a lot of relational art is, that is like this, you know, it claims to be doing something political, but it doesn't understand the political that it's doing, and hence it reproduces the very thing that it claims it's challenging. And so I, there, I think that is a problem. But I, you know, artists using theory is something that I would applaud. <laughs> um, I hope that I hope that answers your questions. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another. And Alberto Valentini would like to ask a question, please. You, you can. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, brutalism was uh, like is it now kind of this uh, style for the so for a social struggle. But when you when we use it in the context for uh, the working class housing, it seems like we are pushing the working class in this uh, not really hospitable place, like uh, taking uh, Robin Hood housing uh, as an example, like is this massive uh, like mass of shapes, hundreds of meters of corridors. It's not a really place where someone would want to live. It kind of reminds me of the sales of, in Scampia that we have here in Italy that are going to the, the same problems right now. So when uh, we make these huge parks, huge structure, like just for uh, the working class, isn't that kind of uh, a segregation toward them? Like we're put, putting them out of the center of the city, maybe where they have to work, so that puts them in need for other kind of infrastructure just to get their life going. Thank you. Um, yes, OK, that you raised lots of very important points that I think, uh, you know, I need to address because I think um, the, what you said is partially it, it, what you said is partially not true of Robin Hood Garden. So it's an element that I need to clarify, and that's to do with its location. Um, so if I take your last point first, Robin Hood Gardens is actually very central. Um, it's it's in a part of East London that was industrial. It was the docks when the estate was built, but very quickly was becoming de-industrial. Um, and then I guess it was on a limb, it was on the edge of East London, but still a very much a historic part of where working class people lived. Now it's very, very central. You know, it's right next to the second financial centre, right next to it. Um, it's incredibly well connected in terms of transport, in terms of markets, 
um, and all of those kinds of things. So it's not at all out pushed out of the city. What's actually going to happen is when it's demolished, the working class residents that are there will be pushed out of the city. You know, so Robin Hood Gardens is a means for, for it, that's how they stay in the city. If it goes, they'll be pushed out of the city. Um, that happens in every one of these redevelopments. Um, so that's the first, that's a kind of correction, I guess, to my talk to make it clear that it is actually centrally located, reasonably centrally located. In terms of your other questions, which are, you know, you'll know this, they're raised against brutalism a lot. They're raised against Robin Hood Gardens all the time. Everybody you speak to says people hated living there. It's a hellhole. Um, they never spoke to residents, ever. Um, and part of our photography and writing project or interview project that we've been conducting um, has was premised on talking to residents themselves and taking portraits of residents themselves about their experience of the estate on the grounds that no one ever spoke to them. And what we found, and actually it's not such a surprise, that they loved living there. They loved it. Um, we, in, in interviewing about 30 odd people, we found one person who hated it, um, probably about probably about five that sort of didn't like it very much and would rather be living in, you know, some other kind of housing. The rest of them loved their life there. They also objected to the fact that it had been left to rot by the council, you know, who, who for like 15 years has hardly put any investment into. So everybody had problems, you know, with the structure because it wasn't being repaired. But that's not a problem with the, the estate. So those streets in the sky that I showed briefly at the beginning, the garden, um, the interlocking apartments, um, all of these things people love and have all sorts of wonderful stories to tell about living there. So it's not true that they don't like it. Um, what is true is that middle class people who tend to live in nice houses think that working class people are dumb and hate living in modernism. But I really don't think that's true. Um, and it's it's not e it's not even true despite years and years and years of stigmatization. So everybody will tell you that it's a hell hole. Um, every resident knows that everybody will tell them it's a hell hole, and yet they still like living there. And then you think, well, let's look at some other examples. Um, and if you go to the Barbican uh, in in the centre of London, in the city of London, it's another or a much bigger concrete modernist brutalist uh, um, uh, apartment complex, let's call it that, huge place. Um, for many years, people said, oh, it's a concrete monstrosity and la 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 la. But actually, um, these days, everybody loves it. The media love it. The government love it. The flats sell for millions of pounds because it's always been occupied by the middle class. Um, it was never built for the working class. It was always built for the middle class. Um, there's no, I mean, they're very different styles, but there's no obvious reason why that concrete construction um, is OK. And Robin Hood Gardens concrete construction is 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 awful. Um, so I, I don't buy the argument that the working class don't like living in these places. Um, England is a very parochial uh, culture in many respects. I mean, in other respects, it isn't at all. But in many respects, it is. Um, which is always telling everyone that they want their personal little house and their picket fence and all of this. But that's not a reality uh, for most people living in. I mean, it's not a, real, a possible reality for most people living in in this country. You know, we need kinds of housing um, that can accommodate large numbers of people. And I'd say Robin Hood Gardens is a pretty interesting uh, uh, and, and in many ways successful attempt to provide that. Um, but I'm not saying it's without fault. Of course not. Um, and of course, it was built on little money um, and it hasn't been prepared, repaired and things like that. Um, but yeah, so I don't think it's inhospitable. Another, I guess, one last thing to say about it is. Yeah, you know, maybe a risk of repeating myself, but but the reason it's deemed inhospitable is because working class people live there, not it's inhospitable. We shouldn't put working class people there. That's why all of these critics like David Cameron, Hodge, Jenkins that I showed at the beginning, they don't care whether there's a, a council. They don't care that it's being demolished and there'll be no council housing. 
um, you know, because their real distaste is working class estates, large numbers of working class people living in the inner city. They don't like to see them. They don't like what they do to their land values, um, all these kinds of things. But I don't think it's the estate itself. I hope that, hope that answers. OK, uh, thank you. That wasn't, okay. Thank you for thank this you. answer too. Other questions, please? The hand up. Use the end icon if you would like to, to ask question or, or write it in the chat, please. Uh, uh, before, yeah. Andre, Andre, I would I would like to ask a question to ask um, a question like a comparison. Uh, maybe I'll put my uh, in my you presentation, I, I, go first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I showed um, Park Hill in Sheffield uh, that has um, undergone a different form kind of generation. It's been gentrified, to put it very bluntly. Whereas, as we know, um, Robin Hood Gardens been destroyed. So, uh, surely this is a very uh, it's a different context, but how would you summarize the core differences between these two major brutalist council houses? Mm, yeah, thank you. So that, again, that follows very nicely from that last question. Um, so that let's, I'm going to bring in a third building as well. So there's another one uh, called um, Balfron Tower, designed by Erno Goldfinger, which is only half a mile away from Robin Hood Gardens. So it's the same part of London, for years called a concrete monstrosity, da -de da -de da um, Then about two years ago, it, it was given over to a private developer who evicted all the working class residents and has now um, refurbished it in traditional modernist, brutalist style uh, and is selling the individual apartments to private investors and, and middle class um, inhabitants. You know, so it, it's a very clear example of how uh, the middle class don't like brutalism until they get their hands on it and then they love it um in you know in some instances um and also this strange moment where you flip between that which should be demolished for its monstrosityness or it should be taken over and gentrified and you know these buildings seem to fall one way or the other and when they fall on the demolition side they're still hated until the last moment and when they fall on the other side you see this strange transmutation when they go from being monstrosities to being private investments. And, and Park Hill is a really uh, very, very clear example of that. Um, you know, for years and years stigmatized in all of these ways. I lived in Sheffield, actually. I did my degree there, which is where Park Hill is. Um, and so knew people on the estate and would walk around the estates and so on. Um, but you would hear all the time that this was this awful, you know, carbuncle on the top of the hill. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> It was taken over or some of it was taken over, the residents evicted and then it was done up and sold. Um, the, there's a question about what, what one state rather than another gets picked, in, you know, which can't simply be chance. You know, I think it, I think a lot of it kind of is chance, you know, simply a developer says, you know what, let's not bulldoze this let's market it on the basis of its brutalism. We might make more money that way. You know, and I think that's sometimes just a local call. Um, but at the same time, I think, well, and another reason for the one building getting demolished and another not is that it depends on the footprint. So Robin Hood Gardens is quite, has quite a spacious footprint. It has that big garden. Um, there's quite a lot of land around it. So there was much more money to be made in this instance by demolition. Whereas Balfour Tower has a very small footprint. So actually, they probably couldn't have built as much if they put a new tower on. And Park Hill is massive, you know. I mean, it's not as massive as some of the estates you have in Italy, I think, but it's, it's pretty big. So the thought of demolishing all of that can't have been too attractive, even to the most, you know, gung-ho developer. But you, what what's interesting to me is how you see the change over time. So... Balfron, if you look, I bet if you looked at television doc shows, feature films, which often feature 
decrepit, brutalist estates. You could plot the mutation of Balfron, you know, from from monstrosity to middle class utopia, you know, over time. And one thing that the the new inhabitants say, particularly kind of, I think it's particularly kind of revolting turn in in history is they say the trouble is the working class residents who used to live here didn't understand it. That's why they like it. But we understand it because we love social democracy and we love the welfare state and we love the community that these places provide. And so actually we're the real heirs to this architecture and we'll take care of it. And that, I think, is an appalling uh, appraisal of what has really been going on. But you do hear this actually quite a lot. Um, Other questions? Thank you for the answer. Uh, Why? Well, yeah, please, Lorenzo Crocetti, ask. Oh, you, you wrote it. You don't, you prefer, can you read it? Oh, yes, I can. Yes, I've got it. Um, so the question is that we know brutalist architecture can be alienating and also convey a sense of a dystopian reality. Um, but was it meant to be like, okay, was it meant to be like that? Was it supposed to convey dystopia, if you like? I think th this is a nice question, isn't it? Um, it's not entirely, it's difficult to answer. I mean, I guess if I answer it in terms of the Smithsons, let's leave it, you know, with them. Um, first of all, we have this pretty odd word. I don't know how it sounds to you, you know, you know, in Italian or, you know, coming at the English through Italian. But for British people, it sounds as though it's declaring its brutality, its kind of its nastiness, almost its dystopianness, as you say, um, which hasn't always been very helpful for it as an architectural form because it makes it look as though it's deliberately unpleasant. Um, of course, the origins of the name are not that. It's you know, it's to do with the French for raw, you know, the, from uh, Le Corbusier for you know, raw materials, raw raw concrete, um, beton brut. Um, it's also because the Smithsons liked coining phrases, they come up with loads of them, um, and they were deliberately trying to confront what was known as the new empiricism, which in Britain was a softening of Scandinavian architectural modernism, or rather, sorry, a softening of architectural modernism in a kind of Scandinavian style. So that they thought that that, that was that modernism had lost its edge, become too domesticated, too soft. And so the brutal was was a kind of confrontation with the, the loss of the vigour of, um, you know, modernism. But there's a difference between kind of a brutal confrontation and a kind of dystopia. So I think they do. Want, they but they don't want to create a dystopia. And it's interesting that so one of the residents that, that um, we interviewed uh, moved in as soon as the uh, the estate opened. She was a six year old, seven year old, no, no, eight or nine year old girl. Um, and when it was being built, she lived down the road. She would come up with her friends, sit on the edge of the wall and watch the architecture arising over you know these four years. Um, and her line was that when they saw it, they thought it's so fancy. Um, I don't know if that word translates well. So kind of fancy and cool and interesting. So, the, you know, these, this child didn't see it as brutal or dystopian or scary. She thought it was quite an exciting and interesting place. Um, so I think part of the idea that it's brutal and dystopian is because of all the, the meaning that has been heaped on it over the years, if you see what I mean. But it was meant to shock and to be visceral and to evoke sensory complexity. It was meant to do that. Um, uh, Nick, I think the question also uh, at least partly addressed uh, my PowerPoint because I mentioned um, um, Clockwork Orange as one of the films or cultural products that uh, contributed to turning brutalism in some, into something slightly dystopian. I think um, yes, yet yeah, that's 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 the film that makes it dystopian. It's not uh, the building itself. Mm. which, uh, for example, I showed uh, Brunel's University. 
um, which is a place where the main character is being tortured. So of course you you associate it with with something brutal, some violent, and so on. But uh, it'd be interesting to to yeah to find out more about how this architecture was perceived in the early six seventies, how it is perceived today. Uh, there's all, there are also other connotations, like, for example, sort of machine age aesthetic, mm. which might be quite lost now because we tend to think of machines, uh, we introduce machine into, uh, you know, IT stuff. So it's, it's the idea of the machine age is no longer uh, connoted by these massive structures. But back in the 60s, uh, it still was much, uh, you know, imbued with this kind of uh, gigantic um, machines, industries, structures, buildings. Mm. So I think that's, 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 that has to do something with the idea of what is technolo technological, advanced. So I think it's uh, the film does uh, add that nuance, but it was not meant to be like that. Uh, although this is just my hypothesis, we need to kind of uh, check it, you know, do a bit of groundwork and also, you know, field work. You know, I, I don't know, was the architect actually designed that building? But I think uh, there's a gap, there's definitely a gap mm. between us and the 60s in terms of technology, what technology looks like. Yeah, yeah no, I, you're absolutely right. And, and I mean, you know, the it's clear that the kind of there was a, there's been a culture war over um housing you know that that has that that has taken uh, that, that has kind of that has worked alongside this sort of revanchist urbanism you know the return of the city into this place of huge profit making um that's been accompanied by an assault on brutalist architecture because that's associated with you know affordable living and working class you know, people and so on. And so films like Clockwork Orange, uh, you know, were very damaging for social housing, you know, and, and it, it, there are any number of, there, there are good, you know, I could, there are sort of about six or seven films or TV shows that feature Robin Hood Gardens as a terrifying, psychotic background, you know, for various different nefarious activities. That doesn't do the estate any good in people's minds. Um, there's also there's a video there's a great um, Levi's ad that was shown when I was a child, where a, a man smuggles a pair of Levi's into Russia after he's come back from visiting the West, um, and when he gets back into his room, he pulls on his Levi's and he's like all thrilled to have this great new item. But one of the scenes of um, of Russia is Robin Hood Gardens put in fake snow, um, so they use it as a backdrop of the Soviet Union and authoritarianism so you know it, it functions for in all of these different ways for those who don't really want to favor i guess the architecture uh why other people are, are thinking about what they wish to ask? I have a question too. Um, my question is about probably a more basic problem. What I would use very well is the way people have framed uh, this kind of social housing as artworks as artifacts abstract and framed in another context and discuss the way they did it in Venice and the VA but VA, uh, but uh, there is some uh, 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 what I think it's a more basic problem with other other questions are uh, touched in, in some ways the, the point is in my opinion, is there any relationship between the modulation of the social, of the living architecture, and the very form, aesthetic form of these artifacts? 
which kind which kind of relationship you should the second point about this is about work class working class culture aesthetics is there a working class class aesthetics or not what does it mean uh, the, the the aesthetic they 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 give some themselves or something interpreting it as their aesthetic or or speaking about buildings or uh, like uh, the the robin hood gardens you spoke about uh, is there any uh, a problem of taking possession of this place by by the working class not simply of of semantization which comes before or how does it become a conflict of attributes and redefine meanings, a reuse and resignification, more than simply a, a clash of an intention against a behavior, a living, a kind of living? This, this is the, the second point about the same, same subject. I, I'm wondering whether this, the, these kind of uh, simply interpreting it as a, a, a bourgeois reuse of uh, something made for the, the working class, the problem of gentrification and so on, uh, it doesn't show this kind of theme that's more basic to architecture. Do the, uh, the modulation of the social depends on uh, architectural form and how uh, how much even this is the um, the question i have a question for jacopo too but later maybe please yeah. thank you D just to clarify your first question when you asked about the relationship of the social and the artifacts mm -hmm. was was that the 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 kind of the um the venice architect artifact or was that the the actual estate itself no uh, I was thinking about the the, the state itself, yeah, the state okay. itself. That's why it's more basic than the the frame in in the um, art art scene of the of the art defense, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. That's um, that's very helpful. Um, your la your second question is very helpful because I hadn't framed it in my mind that way. So I'll have a go at answering that in a minute. But your first point, that's. So in the in my in my um, book and in the article I've published on the estate, that's rather than what I said today. That's my kind of problem. I think my question is how do the social relations of well how do social relations um, inform the architecture? How does the architecture handle or modulate or articulate social relations? And I've come I've come to the I mean, it does it in a number of ways, but one of the ways it does it, I think, is it takes, I suggest it takes particular social problems, let's put it like that, um, or social themes, and articulates them in different ways in different parts of the estate. So to take one example, it takes the problem of the street. You know, the street they argued was being destroyed by the automobile it wasn't the, the old street that it used to be so how do you solve that or how do you address that you raise the street up in the air um and then you get the street then develops other kinds of qualities you know in its new position um or how do how do you solve the problem of mass production or, or rather how do you solve the product the problem of producing enormous volumes that were needed at that time for the population well they their argument was that you you confront industry um as a sort of productive force rather than you rather than hiding it and so it was important for them that it's slab built concrete rather than poured concrete or it's important that you see the structure rather than hide the structure as if industry provides a, a an aesthetic for the building that's if you like true to the capacity to produce lots of houses or the garden i'm i'm kind of fascinated by the mound in the garden what's going on why does it put this enormous mound man in the garden of the estate 
And I think what they're doing is trying to architecturally address a, a problem of landscape, you know, of access to landscape in the inner city, that one that isn't isn't sort of parochial or nativist, but engages with the capacity of industry to produce shapes, you know, enormous mounds and so on. So I think the estate is an, a collection of lots of different forms that handle social problems and social relations, each in their different ways, if you see what I mean. So it's, it's not wise to see Robin Hood Gardens as, as one form, but as a, a collection of many different forms, all kind of held together. Um, but I, so I, that's been the driving question for me all along. How can you think of these conflictual social relations expressed in architectural form? Um, and then to your second, and I do think the Smithsons and Robin Hood Guns are really unusual in the way that they do that. But the second question, is there a working class um, culture or a working class aesthetics? Um, I think my answer is no. <laughs> um, I think. I'm, so I'm thinking of class in, in a, not in the way that a sort of E.P. Thompson type Marxism might, where, where one talks about the cultures of resistance, cultures of labour and so on, that, you, that are distinctly working class. Um, I'm interested in, I, I, I guess, a more Marxist idea that class is simply the condition of, of being pulled out of shape by social relations, of being compelled to of not having any of socialized to, into abjection, all of these kinds of things. So it's a structural condition. Um, and so Robin Hood Gardens doesn't express a working class culture, at least not primarily. It expresses the structural conditions of class in a way that sort of makes them livable or a way that even makes them experimental. And, and we're so used to seeing experiments emerging under kind of bourgeois conditions. I think, what about if we think of experiment being a quality of working class life because of the, the constraints and the crises and so on that, 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 that occurs there? But of course, it's not the working class state, the, the architects, you know, the, in, the development industry that built it, or at least the state actually um, built it. Um, that isn't to say that there isn't some idea of working class culture evident in the estate. There clearly is. And the Smithsons wanted, they wanted, for example, to provide something of a culture of the street, you know, where kids hang out on the street because they don't really have anywhere else to go, for example. Um, they wanted, uh, they wanted to try and recreate something of the bonds of working class community, which they said were being destroyed by suburbanization, that kind of thing. But I don't think primarily it expresses working class culture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tabriga, we'll follow the man. Would you like to ask a question, please? So, go on. Hello, Andrea Catabriga. Your microphone is open. You you can speak. You yeah, so I accidentally opened it. No, I'm just following your debate. It's quite interesting. No, no questions. Simply opening of the microphone. So, just to, just to, Andrea, just to add one more point to your question. What one of the interesting things about the inhabitants of Robin Hood Gardens over the last 20 years or so is that it's a primarily non-white working class population. You know, a large number of Bengali inhabitants, Somali inhabitants. Um, and so the, the sort of cultural uh, forms have, have changed and, and been elaborated uh, over time. And it's interesting that the estate has, has if you like, enabled that you know, a kind of one of the people we interviewed said that the street decks in the summer are like Bangladesh. Um, they enabled you to live an open air life, for example. Um, now, of course, that wasn't designed in, but it's an interesting sense in which culture transforms and is transformed by architecture. Mm 
Yeah, but the, the, the point was exactly that. In my, in my uh, question, that part of my question, uh, something like they reuse a, a, a conflict, the intention of the architects uh, embodied in the in the state forms in the in the state uh, aesthetics, but also the intentions of people um, living there with their culture, uh, uh, negotiating a different way to use the places which, which were planned for other purposes. Um, my idea is that. You cannot identify exactly a working class culture, but a place of a conflict where the, 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 the working class culture and the intention of the architect and um, for new use of the uh, and tentatively uh, also to a new aesthetics, a, a more closer to the something we, we, could, we could call. Uh, working class aesthetics, that kind of working class uh, with these uh, or cultural origins in, as a surplus. So it's very difficult to identify, but if you, uh, if you look at that kind of buildings as a place of, of cultural conflicts also, mm -hmm. not, not simply, which are also class conflicts, but they, they also Go through the classes, the the the, the, the same working class class, uh, working class as a different uh, uh, collection of cultures living in it. So something more complicated, I think. Yes, yeah, so I see. Yeah, I I see your I take your point. Um, I and I think what I'm interested in is the capacity of the, if you like, the capacity of the architecture to modulate structural conditions of class in a way that then gets mobilized used and as you as you rightly say transformed by those who are living in it and i i i, I think that's i think you're right i think that's what robin hood gardens does um i guess the the use becomes a use in relationship to the form and so you get a nice um you know exchange between the two um, you know, form and use and so on. And the Smithsons wanted that. They, you know, they said that this architecture should be, um, they said it should be releasant rather than constraining. That was their idea for it. Um, so thank you. Other questions? People who'd like to take part in our discussion? PhD candidates, uh, historians of architecture. And students too. Uh, Jacopo first, I... Alberto? No. Yeah, I have, I have one more question, but uh, feel free to ask first, Alberto. Okay, Please. Thank you. I just wanted to close uh, off the... So, uh, like a uh, few moments ago, you said that like most of the residents of uh, Robin Hood housing were from uh, different backgrounds. So, I was wondering, is it possible that uh, their acceptance of uh, that condition came, comes from uh, different standards, let's say, because I, like, in the mind of a Western, Western person, the lack of a uh, private space uh, or being uh, bounced to so many people may seem uh, an um, not likable thing, but maybe from uh, other backgrounds, other cultures, it could be. It's well, it's certainly true that the, that um, there's a, England has a strong tradition of imagining. Um, um, people living in castles, you know, separated from everybody and so on. You know, the Englishman's home is his castle, all of this kind of thing. Um, but of course, there's long, there's a long tradition here and, you know, no doubt elsewhere of people living in very cramped um, conditions. You know, in, in England, it's terraced housing. I don't know how that term translates, you know, in terms of Italian architecture. But um, so Robin Hood Gardens in many ways was not a, 
At least Nick, 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 I I show the back-to-back uh, -back houses as a, a okay. kind of prehistory of brutalism, <laughs> right? <laughs> kind of imagery, right. and <laughs> so that you know the Robin Hood Gardens was seen to, was seen to be um, lifting housing up into the air. So I'm glad I've had a chance to say that because actually that's a key part of the estate. You're lifting housing up into the air with those. If you remember that image I showed early on with the first one of the street in the sky, where you have that very strong impression of being really up in the air. 